You can see my screen. Uh, we're live. Not, no, you can't see your screen yet. But you'll be able to put it up. Yes. Anyway. So it was forbidden to dress up as a character in The Lord of the Rings. Yeah, and, so go back for those who are watching now. Ah. So, <laughs> yes. Oh, now suddenly we're live. Yes, right. it's a very different kind of uh, interview, these ones. Before the Soviet Union fell, I heard that uh, people were uh, dressing up as Lord of the Rings characters, renting hundreds of acres of woods uh, as Middle Earth, and staging uh, The Lord of the Rings. And the Soviet Union got wind of it and forbade it. So that you were uh, thrown in jail for... Uh, uh, Dressing up like a hobbit. For acting like a hobbit, yes. And why do you think they were sent to jail for that? Because the Soviet Union is smarter than Peter Jackson. They realized that, uh, as Tolkien said, the scouring of the Shire was uh, an essential part of the, uh, the story. <coughs> and there's a political uh, takeaway to it. And it's an attack on state socialism. Hmm. And these people were uh, acting out uh, Tolkien's vision. Uh, namely, uh, hurrah for the, uh, the original Shire, uh, mm -hmm. boo to the uh, socialist Shire. Uh, and when Peter Jackson was asked why he didn't include that in his movie, he lamely said, we didn't have enough money, mm. which is ridiculous. Yeah. But uh, uh, you don't offend Hollywood by uh, trashing their favorite religion. But what did you, which is? State socialism. Yeah. Are you seeing that more and more these days? Yeah, yeah. I just got through yesterday uh, doing an hour's worth of training required for, uh, at Boston College on diversity, inclusion, and uh, 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 sexual harassment. Oh, Lord. How did that go? Well, uh, <laughs> you, you don't have to do anything. You just sit there and listen to it and click the right buttons. But uh, it's uh, it starts yeah. with a lot of ideological stuff like, uh, you know, uh, Sodomy is good and transgenderism is, uh, is, is good and you must not offend people uh, in, in more acceptable language. And then it mixes that with a lot of uh, necessary stuff about sexual harassment and, and, and so on. But when they, you said you just got to click and go on, did, does that mean you have to lie or that you just have to say, I've read it? Yes, you have to lie. Be, well, what's the right answer? And if you, if you put down the wrong answer, they give you a chance to do the right answer. So what I mean, no, you... Nobody can flunk it. Well, why don't you just say the right thing then, even if they don't want you to? Well, I, I learned to do that. Yes, we we we, we learned no, to lie. Am. Well, but why don't you? Why don't you not lie? Why don't you stand up to them? It doesn't make any difference. All you have to do is get through the hour-long program that certifies, that gives you a certificate that you have uh, been a student of the uh, diversity and inclusion program. It's a federal thing. It's a, it's not a. a but. Uh, but uh, do you not think you're morally obligated to sort of deny the bullshit, for lack of a better word, that they're trying to push well, on yeah, us? Well, yeah, you can try. Uh, well, why, don't, why, don't, instance, why don't you do that? Why don't you? For instance, in the last election, I could not uh, vote for either uh, a murderer who wants to destroy our own children or uh, a liar and a thief. Uh, so I voted for Donald Duck. I, I had oh. a write-in candidate. <laughs> Donald J. Duck. Donald J. Duck. <laughs> So is the hope that if you just kind of go along with this diversity, inclusion stuff, that you'll at least get to be in front of students and do good work for them? Well, this was not just for universities. It was for any, any workplace environment. Huh. Uh, and and I, I don't quarrel with the idea that such a thing is necessary because of all the sexual harassment that's going on. Mm. Uh, what I quarrel with is the ideological stuff they snuck in. Especially that transgender movement. For such a minority, they have uh, uh, totally no, conquered the media. Yeah, uh, it's crazy how quickly. Well, the philosophy behind I, I got in trouble uh, at uh, Boston College. What happened? Well, we were discussing, it was a class in C.S. Lewis, and uh, the last day of the course, uh, we had covered all the books, so it was a free and open discussion. So the students wanted to talk about sexual morality, so I did. And I was asked what I thought of the transgender movement. And I said, uh, I, I think that there's a serious problem here that we have to address and we should not treat any people with disrespect. But I think the, uh, the movement itself is literally insane. Yes. That you can design your own sexuality and that there is no uh, objective truth anymore. Uh, and I came down rather hard on it. And one of the students who was probably transgender himself or else I had a transgender friend uh, complained. To, Did anyone uh, object in the classroom or was it after the fact? Uh, I thought we had a pretty free and open discussion in the classroom. Uh, it was about 50-50, some defending it, some attacking it. 
So I thought it was a good discussion, but one student was very deeply pained by it. Mm. Uh, so uh, I met him, and he's a reasonable guy. He's wrong. He's uh, confused, but uh, uh, you know, we didn't paper it over, but we said, uh, all right, let's agree to disagree. And uh, the administration was, was fine. They, there was no uh, okay. charges brought up or anything like that. It was just a, a complaint that was settled. Mm. Do you think that's only going to get worse? Oh, yes, 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 absolutely. To, uh, to ruffle students' feathers, to, uh, uh, to destroy their peace with themselves uh, is unacceptable. You can lose your job. There are people who have lost their jobs by confessing that they did not agree with the transgender movement. Yeah. I might lose my YouTube channel for doing that thing. You probably will. I will. Yeah. Rumble.com. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. But that, that's, that's my point, though. It's like I would rather – I don't want to be um, – there's a couple of things. One, I don't want to be so – focused on my ideological opponents that I forget those who are suffering with of gender course. dysphoria so Absolutely. that they experience love in my communication with Absolutely. them. Absolutely. I also don't want to talk about it for the sake of talking about it, right. like just to be abrasive, but I also don't want to be a coward and not say anything so that I can keep my nice little the YouTube channel. The thing that bothers me most is that very distinction that you make between the sin and the sinner, between subjectivity and objectivity, between uh, loving people and disagreeing with their ideology. Mm -hmm. That is denied universally by such movements. Uh, you insult what we do, you insult us. If you disagree with what you do, you, you demean us. We are what we do. We are nothing but that. That is our identity. My name is Sauron, that is my ring. You take that from me, you take my identity from me. That scares me. When did that become a philosophical, tenable, just, uh, opinion like how did that enter in or has it always been with us politically i think it had something to do with homosexual activists who uh were intelligent and philosophical enough to realize that they had to be that kind of subjective uh philosophy uh in order to uh to claim uh that uh they had the right <sighs> To control our speech. If, if, if a speech, even though not directed towards individuals and even though it's qualified uh, to uh, help individuals, if, if speech disagrees with your ideology, which you so internalize that that's your identity, then you have the right to say you are hurting me when you are disagreeing with my ideas. Mm. And that, I think, is, is, is the line that's... That, that's that must not be crossed. That's true totalitarianism. Uh, a, a real tyrant doesn't want just to control your body. He wants to control your <coughs> mind. Mm -hmm. Now, I certainly don't believe that all homosexual activists or all <coughs> transgenderists or all liberals or anything like that are in that state. But uh, the ones with the megaphone in those groups seem to. Yes. Yeah, the ones yes. who are speaking on behalf of those groups yes. seem to. Does this um, lack of distinction between what, who I am, what I am, and what I do exist uh, in any other realm of morality? It seems to be specific to do with sexuality. So far, it's specific to do with sexuality, yes. Yes. Uh, and I find that uh, uh, atheists are not threatened by th uh, Christian theology, uh, that theology, insofar as it stays clear of morality, especially sexual morality, is... Uh, perfectly tolerable. Uh, I, I, I feel no religious or, th or theological persecution in society unless it has something to do with sexuality. That's right, yeah. Which is why 100% uh, of everything <clears throat> I have seen uh, on television, political, in the last month is pro-choice. Not a single pro-life ad mm. or, or b because that's obviously about sex. I mean, abortion is a sexual issue. Why does any one any woman want an abortion? Because her birth control failed. And what is birth control? The demand to have sex without having babies. And that's our non-negotiable. Why do you think that is? Why do you think the culture's kind of seems to butt heads mainly with the church on that point? Well, you gotta have some sort of God. And if it's not the real God, it's either sex or power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or both. Sexual autonomy. And maybe, maybe, maybe it's more power than sex. It, but it does seem, though, that um, for many people, those who get a lot of power, if they abuse it, it ends up, 
in something sexual? I think it's the other way around. I think it starts with, with sexual desire, and then you realize that you can be the Lord of your own life. Uh, I think power is probably even a, a, a more dangerous thing than sex because you can only have so much sex, but you're going to have infinite power. Yeah, It's like the difference between money and the stuff money can buy. You can't enjoy yeah. the stuff money can buy beyond a certain limit. Well, money and power are similar in that way in that they exist to be exchanged for something else, yes. the controlling of our surroundings. Yes, and yeah. therefore they are potentially infinite. Yeah. Yeah, and we're not, when we're not rooted in Christ. And, and, and sex is finite. Uh, it's, it's enormously powerful, but it's finite <coughs> until it's joined with power. Sexual autonomy. I, I get to decree that there are now what, yeah. 54 different genders in Canada. Uh, that felt bigoted. I think there's at least a thousand. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> must be. Must be. Yeah. Well, what's sad about it is they're turning people's psycho psychological pain and their um, disorders into a joke, really, by making it so silly. And it obviously won't work because uh, human nature was not designed at Harvard or in Hollywood, but in heaven. Mm. And it will have its revenge. It will not make people happy. Uh, nature makes people happy. Anti-nature does not make people happy. I you, had, can f you can fool them only for a couple of generations. Have you heard of Dr. Jennifer Roback Morris? No. She was on my show, and I want to run this by you. She, she says, we shouldn't think of this as a left versus right issue because there's insanity everywhere. Like Trump was pro-transgenderism in certain instances. And so she said, we should think of them as a Gnostic death cult. Mm -hmm. And... The sexual revolution, she says, since it is a lie and therefore cannot work in reality, needs three things to get off the ground. A lot of power, mm -hmm. a lot of propaganda, mm -hmm. and then finally a scapegoat for when the thing that can't work doesn't. And that thing is Christianity in particular. Especially the Catholic Church. Yeah. yeah. And, Christian mor and Christian sexual morality. Yes. Yeah. Yes. What do you think about that? I feel privileged to be the, the new chosen people. I mean, Catholics are the, uh, the, uh, the new Jews. Uh, uh, instead of racial anti-Semitism, it's sexual anti-Semitism. We're the, uh, the traditionalists, the holdouts, the ones who claim that uh, we're God's chosen people or recipients of God's chosen revelation. That's, that's harmful to diversity. You can't have that much diversity. Everything must be relativist. Uh, an absolutist has no place in a diverse community. An absolutist has no place. Yeah. There's that line from the Second Vatican Council, I believe it is, that says, when God has forgotten, the creature himself becomes unintelligible. Yeah, yeah. Pope John Paul II loved to quote uh, a line like that. Uh, uh, Only Christ reveals man to himself. He yeah. doesn't just reveal who God is, he reveals who we are. And if we really believed that, if, if that's our true identity, that would permeate our whole day. Yeah. The, the practice of the presence of that philosophy, even, even if not incarnated in that person, would change everything. Whereas if I don't take my identity in who I am before <laughs> God, as I don't believe he exists or I don't believe he loves me, then the only thing that's on offer is what the world suggests will make me happy, like ambition and... Um, uh, self-aggrandizing and these sorts of things. And then the sins that seem to uh, assuage the loneliness that results when those things don't work. So like sex and drink and all this stuff is just a way to... What's so interesting to me when I read the Old Testament is that uh, in one sense, I don't find the modern situation there because there's no secularism. You either worship the true God or you worship another God. Yeah. Here, and I we think don't... that's 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 what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, if God designed the human heart, there's an infinite vacuum there which can't be filled with finite things. So you've got to pretend that something finite is infinite. You've got to worship some idol if you don't worship the God, whether it's sex or power or the right or the left or whatever. Uh, so relativism itself becomes a new absolute. Yeah. Well, maybe that's why some of these social movements, what they're aiming at, never seem to be concrete in reality, like Marxism uh, working, for example, or the sexual revolution. Or it's, it's utopian, as it were. Yeah. So I can make something that doesn't yet exist infinite because it doesn't exist yet to disappoint me in its finiteness. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that is also why to believe in objective truth is very threatening to that, because objective truth about nature is always finite, and it has limits, and you bump up against a wall. But the Gnostic has no walls, never bumps up against anything. He can create a new universe. Mm. I think that's why she called it a Gnostic death cult, because it seems to be at war with the body. This idea Yeah, because that, the body has limits. Yeah. What do you think? Because you wouldn't have thought 20, 30 years ago that transgenderism would be as big a thing as it is. No. No, it's <laughs> no. astonishing. As Ricky Gervais said, no one saw that coming. <laughs> that one day you get kicked offline for saying women don't have penises and now you get banned. <laughs> <laughs> well, ask Larry Summers, you know, the president of Harvard who got fired, first president in Harvard's history to get fired mm. for not believing in uh, the idea that there is some innate difference between men and women, but saying that it is an idea worth discussing before we refute it and go on wow. to other ideas, uh, which explain why Harvard is not uh, drawing enough women to the hard sciences. Right. And the feminists at that, at that faculty meeting uh, rose uh, together and demanded his resignation and got it soon after for believing that that, that idea is, is, is worth discussing ought to be expressed in public. The idea that every single culture in the history of the human race has believed. Mm. Reminds me of Chesterton's gate or wall. The idea that you shouldn't tear it down unless you know what it's for. Yeah. And we're just tearing everything down. Of course. Thinking it'll be great. Which is, I think, the real attractiveness in postmodernism and deconstructionism. Could you define those terms for us? Well, postmodernism is a vague term, which is basically a uh, disagreement with uh, the power of reason as uh, in the Enlightenment. And deconstructionism is the application of that, especially to, uh, to texts and literature mm -hmm. and words. Words do not intend things. Mm. Uh, there is no objective truth. Uh, words create your own truth. Right. Th yeah. Yep. So there's no concept within the term that's necessarily linked to it. We can, if you think of a term like a cardboard box that I present to you and you open it up and there's something in there, something I'm conveying to you, mm -hmm. you can sort of just replace that object within that term. Yes. And it all, it, it is also associated with voluntarism. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, it is the will that commands the reason to say what it wants it to say. Uh, there's no, there's no humility. There's no learning from the reason what reality is like. Yeah. There is, there is only the will to power. It's Nietzschean. Nietzsche is the most popular philosopher today. More doctoral theses are written about Nietzsche than anybody else. And of course, Nietzsche was insane, literally. He spent the last 11 years of his life in an asylum. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just his syphilis, it was his philosophy that drove him insane. He had I, some... think, I think the idea in Nietzsche that most drove him insane was questioning the will to truth for the first time. He said, all philosophers before me uh, failed to have the courage to ask the most dangerous of all questions, why truth? Why not rather the lie? Mm -hmm. There's no answer to that question. I mean, if you answer that question, you're assuming the will to truth. Hmm. So you can't prove it. What about if you just said something that like, because aligning myself with reality is more conducive to my own good, it works better. That's your truth. Mm. My truth is different than your truth. Don't impose your truth on my <clears throat> truth. I do recall Nietzsche writing something to the end of, uh, it was an answer to a, rhetorical question of if this uh, world that uh, you believe in Nietzsche is so grim and dull, then why pursue that truth and try to lay that out? And his answer is no reason. You choose it. Mm -hmm. And that's your courage. Yes, life is meaningless, but you love it anyway, because you want to. How much has Nietzsche been distorted by Christians trying to refute him? Do you feel like Christians are fair to Nietzsche? I don't know either I, I know Nietzsche what, yeah. or the Christians who are, whom you're talking about well enough to answer mm. that question. What do you think, Neil? Because I know you like Nietzsche. I mean, Nietzsche has many sides. I just, he's, he's, a, he's certainly a genius. I, I, know, I, I know as a Christian, I get very frustrated when Richard Dawkins, who clearly never read even the Summa article on a God's existence, seeks to refute him and just totally misunderstands Aquinas. And I'm wondering if people perhaps in the atheist community or even those who are theists who like Nietzsche think that maybe we're misinterpreting him. I, 
for me, um, something my professor said in college was something to the end of Nietzsche contradicts himself, apparently, and apparently knowledgeably he does that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it's kind of like there, I think, are people who read one or two quotes from Nietzsche, Nietzsche and um, sort of think they understand the gist mm -hmm. of what he's saying. But kind of part of the point of Nietzsche is he doesn't really have one gist. It's sort of. Uh -huh. The only way to truly understand him is to kind of grapple with him at multiple points because he says things he doesn't really mean that are hyperbolic and that he thinks is poetic and things like that. And I think that, yeah, I don't know. I think he has a lot to say, but I think it's kind of difficult to grasp. Toss and, it out. Yeah. I yeah, see. Well, right. the law of non-contradiction uh, does not apply to Nietzsche. He deliberately contradicts mm -hmm. himself. So does Plato, uh, though. He, he, I don't think he ever read Walt Whitman, but, uh, you know, that line from Leaves of Grass, do I contradict myself? Very well, then, I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes. Very good. Hurrah for me. I contradict myself. But do you think Plato contradict himself intentionally? Yes, I think Nietzsche did, too. But you think Plato did that? Yeah. Well, Plato playing games with you sometimes. He certainly believes in the law of non-contradiction. Right. What was that? Play devil's advocate. Let's talk about that just real quick. That Muslim philosopher whose name I forgot, who said Al Ashari, the one who thinks to be beaten and burned is what is not the same. No, no. He said the one who den whoever denies the law of non-contradiction should be beaten and burned until he finally admits that to be beaten and burned is not the same thing as to not be beaten and burned. Oh, that was I not Al Ashari. <laughs> Al Ashari was a voluntarist. That was a, a rationalist. Hmm. Well, you know, there's the, uh, the famous Euthyphro problem that philosophers mm -hmm. talk about that's relevant to this. Uh, in the Euthyphro, uh, Socrates has a dialogue with this arrogant young man who believes that he knows what piety is, and piety is simply doing the will of the gods. And Socrates asks the question, is a thing pious because the gods will it, or do the gods will it because it's pious? And Euthyphro says, oh, the only reason it's pious is that the gods will it. Mm -hmm. In other words, if the gods willed you to lie, you should lie. If you, they willed you to hate, you should hate. And Socrates says, no, it's the opposite. And when the early church fathers uh, dealt with that problem, they didn't accept either Socrates' rationalism right. or uh, Euthyphro's voluntarism. They said that the good and the true uh, are what God is, and, yes. and God's will is what God is. So the will and the intellect are absolutely united in God, so neither one is the authority over the other. They are identical. So the Euthyphro dilemma is a false one. It is indeed. Mm. But uh, Nietzsche certainly a, a Euthyphroian, and uh, so is postmodernism, and uh, the Enlightenment is, uh, is Socratic rationalism. Reason is higher than anything, even God. So that uh, uh, if scientific reason says miracles are impossible and God says, well, I'm going to do one, uh, rationalism say, no, you're not. Has it been difficult for you being a philosopher, teaching at a secular school, and maybe feeling like you can't have these open discussions about really important issues? Well, it's uh, not a secular increasingly school. So. I teach at Boston College. It's, it's not a, a secular school. No, it's a Jesuit school. It's, but, okay, so it's worse. That's halfway between Catholic and secular. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this, so earlier you said that you were forced to go through this inclusivity training. That wasn't on behalf of the school specifically, or did the school mandate that you do it? Uh, I believe that the federal law, Title IX, mandates that all okay. uh, universities uh, require that. Yeah. And I have no, no quarrel with that because there is a problem about sexual harassment. Sure. But I have a quarrel with uh, sliding in the leftist ideology into yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. Has it been as difficult as people think, uh, speaking your mind on a university campus as a professor? Or do you find actually, despite all the hype, people are generally open, students are generally open to having intellectual discussions about... Boston College is an unusual place. If I were teaching at a state university, I would be in trouble. I would probably lose my job. But Boston College mm. is a, a genuinely Jesuit and Catholic university that still believes in objective truth and, and academic freedom. Uh, it's kind of a mirror of our own society. Uh, most people still have enough common sense to be rather suspicious of the far left ideology. Mm. And most people have enough common sense to be suspicious of the far right ideology, but those are two powerful forces that are increasingly driving us apart. Yeah. Although doesn't it seem like the far left ideology has government, big tech, yep. universities, oh yeah, uh, corporations? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, we're, we're getting closer and closer to Brave New World.
That's the prophetic book. And that doesn't seem to depress you. Like, <coughs> I, that's what's interesting to me. It's like well, you, you've lived long enough to see me. the the devolution of the universities in America and. Oh, I'm a, I'm a horrible pessimist, but I'm also <laughs> selfish, and I'm 85 years old, and I'm getting out of this insane asylum pretty soon. <laughs> I remember Benedict Rochel saying something like that. Oh, God, I can't wait. <laughs> yes. <laughs> How do you feel about death, your death specifically? Death is wonderful. Dying is awful. Yeah. Dying is losing. Death is winning. But once you watch through that door, you're guaranteed heaven. No matter how painful your purgatory is, it's, it's a joy because you want it. It's God's will, and you're, you're totally in that will. You can't sin after death. Therese, that's, the, that's the best thing about death. Mm. It takes away sin. Therese of Lisieux, on her deathbed, said that her soul was kind of engaging with the deepest, darkest doubts uh, of God's existence, you know? The, the atheism was plaguing her soul. Do you experience that? Do you fear that you've just sort of wasted your life and it's just going to be a big black nothingness? No, no, not that. But uh, uh, I've experienced more spiritual warfare this past summer than ever before in my life. Mm. Uh, I always believed in it, but I never felt it. Uh, I've lost a lot of sleep. I've had a lot of silly worries. And uh, uh, only God and his angels uh, come in and, and deal with it. I mean, I've never, I've never experienced such a, uh, a direct answer to prayer yeah. as, as my prayer, God, get rid of these bad angels, send your angels, and he does it. Wow. How do you, can you share more about that, about what that spiritual warfare was like and the specifics of it? I don't want you to feel like you got to share no, too much. No, except in general, uh, pride and despair are really the same, but they manifest themselves in opposite ways. <sighs> and some people are tempted to pride and arrogance and uh, uh extending their power. Others are tempted to, to pessimism and despair and giving up. I'm, I'm the pessimist. Okay. I'm an optimist by conviction, but a pessimist by uh, yeah, temperament. You don't seem that way. And the devil, well, this is probably why I joke a lot. Okay. A laugh, clown, laugh, you know, that, <laughs> yeah. uh, that syndrome. Yeah. Uh, and, and the devil knows us very, very well yeah. and hits us at our weak point. So he, he tempts me to give up. Uh, and sometimes the temptations are, are really, really stupid. And I'll just forget how stupid they are and I'll succumb. How do, you, do. how do you distinguish between spiritual warfare and just having a bad night's sleep or having certain you worries? Or is that a false dilemma? You don't. You I, don't? don't know, I don't know if it's a false dilemma or not. Uh, I don't think it is because the supernatural is not the same as the natural. But they blend. The devil usually uses natural that's, forces, that's uses meant, our weakness. Yeah. But it's the strategy of the war room in hell that's the origin of all of that. So I, I, I think to, uh, to isolate the supernatural as literally supernatural and miraculous on the one hand, and the natural as simply natural on the other hand is a false dilemma. Yeah, mm. they usually blend. For me, I was at a, giving a conference recently, and I just felt this cloud of despair yep. upon me, this fog that I couldn't see through, and everything felt hopeless, and I was anxious and scared. And uh, it's usually in that moment, unfortunately, that you're not thinking, wow, this could be spiritual warfare. So I, I stopped, and I prayed some prayers, and within half hour, it was really like a dark cloud lifted. Yes, yes. I've never experienced such a sudden answer to prayer as, as in that area. Yes, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. I've said before that trying to understand Christianity without reference to the demonic is like trying to understand the Lord of the Rings without reference to Sauron. It's yes. just a, it's a boring story, <laughs> yes. and it's not one that makes any sense, really, you know? Um, and maybe it's because we've sort of forgotten about the intervention of the demonic that we're looking for enemies within and without the church mm -hmm. they have to be the they have to be the wellspring of the problem yes yes we we if we don't admit that we wrestle against principalities and powers then we've got to find some natural substitute mm. whether it's the left or the right or, or or the whites or the blacks or the jews or the mm -hmm. the semites whoever yep you gotta have a scapegoat how old are you now 85. Um, as you've sort of grown in your Christian journey here at 85, would you, if you were to talk to young Peter Kraft as he was writing his first book, would, would you want him to uh, focus on a particular topic more than you have? 
or say this is more important than you think or the thing that you think is really important isn't as important as you think? Or The answer to that is going to be disappointingly obvious. <laughs> okay. Focus on the plus, not the minus, on God's mercy, not your stupidity. Yeah. No matter how bad we are, no matter how weak we are, no matter how stupid we are, God is stronger. There's a movie, don't know the title, don't know the main character. Uh, I asked a lot of moviegoers. Uh, I maybe, know this movie Maybe exists. Neil will get it. Neil, 10 points There's if you a, get it. Uh, and $10. <laughs> uh, a holy priest, I think he's a Franciscan, in some South American country, mm -hmm. who's combating corruption. He sees corruption everywhere, including in the church. And finally, his bishop lets him down somehow. He's trying to help the poor people, and the bishop is so corrupt that he's preventing it. And he says, <clears throat> he does the opposite of St. Francis. He, he throws away his, not his rich secular clothes, but his, uh, his priestly garments, mm. says, I'm out of here. And there's this woman who's been trying to... Uh, uh, to tempt him all his life, and he's resisted her temptation, and now he accepts, and he goes and shacks up with her in a, in a little hut in the wilderness. And you think this is an anti-Catholic, pro-sexual, romantic, mm -hmm. uh, idealist thing, but uh, it isn't, just the opposite. He gets uh, a little more antsy and antsy, and the relationship uh, uh, cool somewhat, mm. uh, and she still loves him, but she, he's not sure <clears throat> that he loves her. And then one day she finds him missing in bed in the middle of the night, and she knows where he walk, goes. And he goes, she goes down this little road into a tiny little chapel, and sure enough, there he is, all alone, prone on the floor, talking with Jesus in the crucifix. And she says, "You're going to go back, aren't you?" And he says, "Yes." He said, "I don't understand it. Why? They're going to kill you." Why are you going to back there? And he points to Christ in the, in the tabernacle and says, because he is stronger. Three powerful words. And then mm. he goes back and he is martyred. Mm. And that's the end of the movie. Mm. An extremely powerful line. If anybody knows that movie, <laughs> put, it in, put it in the comments. Yeah, that is. He is stronger. I want to speak about adultery for a second um, and just destroying everything the Lord's given you. And, and the reason this is on my mind is, um, without giving any details away, a dear friend of mine's father is on his deathbed. And this man, from all appearances, kamikaze his marriage and went to another country, was with prostitutes, came back, just a sad life, living in government housing, very overweight, maybe an alcoholic, mm -hmm. addicted to gambling. And... I hear that story and I'm like, I, I totally get the temptation to just destroy everything and go look for heaven here on mm. earth. I've said before that I, I don't know if I would trust any man or woman who's been married for more than 15 minutes who doesn't understand the temptation of, of going elsewhere to of find course. what they have not yet found. But having that image of this person in my mind is like, yeah, don't, don't, this is this beautiful marriage that you have, Matt, and these lovely children and this beautiful Catholic little life with your friends. This is not unbreakable. You can destroy the whole thing with your own stupidity, mm -hmm. but it ends in that. Uh, and, and having, <laughs> and I pray for his salvation and I have been praying for it, but I, I, uh, yeah, that's like, there is a way that seems right to man and in the end mm -hmm. leads to death. That's sort of what I'm seeing in this person's life. Well, Scripture frequently uses that sexual analogy for our relationship with God. Uh, idolatry yeah. is spiritual adultery. We're meant to be married to God. And it's a stormy marriage. It's not uh, uh, easy. It's not automatically satisfying. There's war in it as well as peace. Mm. Uh, and we look for an alternative. Yes. So we, we, we break it. Every time we sin, we commit spiritual adultery. I mean, sin is insanity. We know from our past experience, uh, time and time again, every time we say to God, no, my will be done, not yours, it's miserable. And every time we say your will be done, it's, it's peace and joy yeah. deep down in the long run. And yet the next Day. moral choice we have, uh, <laughs> all right, my way or your way? Yeah. Well, let's see, God, I'm not sure. Let me try my way. Maybe that'll work this time. We're nuts. Yeah. But God deeply loves his severely retarded children. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I often think that's the story of Christianity. The, the long story of God 
uh, disagreeing with me when I tell him I'm shit and unworthy of his love and affection. Yeah. 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 I love that he seems to disagree with our opinion of ourselves in that regard. God has to have the greatest sense of humor in in all of existence. There's no other way he could tolerate us. (laughs) But it's not just toleration. It's, It's passionate love. What has your, what ha, how has marriage sanctified you, sort of specifically? How long have you been married now? Six, I think 60 years. It's terrific. Congratulations. Well, it's, it's shown me what can be done by ordinary human choice to love. And that's not a stoical, I'll endure this, that's a, uh, I will actively work on this wonderful vocation mm-hmm. and create and perceive all the good that I can in it. And every marriage and every family is full of, of, of some disappointments and failures, mm-hmm. especially with, with children. The mm-hmm. more you have, the more joys and sorrows you have. We have only four. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a number of friends. I have a dozen. Uh, that's, that's an amazing achievement. I've, I've written 100 books, but I've only had four kids. Uh, to have five kids is more than to have four kids plus 100 books. <laughs> <laughs> but you love them anyway. And, yeah. uh, and it's always somewhat reciprocated. I mean, no matter how rebellious the kid is, that you're, you're the father or mother of that kid, and the kid knows it. And the kid knows that, that you gave them life, and it's the pass it on system, uh, pay it forward system. You, you, can't, you can't even try to give to your parents uh, a gift greater than they gave to you, so you give it to your kids. And if you don't have kids, you give it to the world or the church or, yeah. or your friends. And, and we all deeply know that. And we all, no matter how screwed up we are, uh, conscience isn't totally dead. And conscience isn't just negative, don't do this. Conscience is, this is what you're called to. You're called to do something. You're called to be a saint, far more than you are. But that's the direction. No matter how little you climb the mountain, the direction is up rather than down. And we all know that. What's been more difficult for you, marriage or having children? Oh, children, children. I can, I mean, my, love, my wife and I are equals and, and respect each other and understand each other <laughs> far more than, than parents and children understand each other. Mm. How do you think parents can maintain their peace in light of a rebellious child? And maybe not just rebellious, but somebody who is mutilating their sexual organs, right? I, I, I come across parents who come to me and they say this is happening because of the transgender insanity. Uh, that's an extreme example. But how, how do we as parents maintain our peace as opposed to flagellating ourselves and thinking if only I had have done a better job? Which... I've got to be very honest with you. I don't know. Uh, none of our kids have deeply disappointed us. They're, they, <laughs> they, all, they have kept the faith. Yeah. They, they still believe. Uh, and that's an unusual thing. Uh, when I was a kid, growing up as a Protestant, every family I knew was Protestant, and I didn't know a single family that had a divorce in it. I must have known 50 or 100 families. Now, as a Catholic, I yeah. also know maybe 50 or 100 families, and almost all of them are Catholic. Not a single one does not have a divorce in it. Mm. I think that's, that's a remarkable breakdown of the fundamental institution in, in civilization. Uh, th- that that can't be sustainable. We talk about a sustainable ecology. What about a sustainable human ecology? We don't have it. Uh, I don't think our society is going to last more than a couple more generations. I think it's just going to fall apart. What will that look like when it does? It might be civil war. Mm-hmm. The left and the right are increasingly angry. It might be just disillusion, like the end of the Roman Empire. It might be a reversion to barbarism. It might be just, um, you know, not with a bang, but a whimper. Mm -hmm. I love that poem, by the way. Yeah. Um, So, all right, it's easy for you since you're on your way out, but what about these young ones and these young parents with children? How are they to maintain hope? How should they live the Christian life amidst this turmoil and pessimism and insanity? Well, you have to have a, a kind of optimism and a kind of pessimism. The pessimism of realizing that you're in a decaying and decadent culture and you're going to be increasingly called upon to make heroic sacrifices. Mm. 
uh, and an optimism to realize that he is stronger. Yeah. And he will win in the end, and we are on the winning side. We are we are hobbits, and we're facing orcs. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, God has given us the whole story, including the future. And if you look at the book of Revelation as as future history, and of course it's highly symbolic and mystical, but it's true, uh, you see two things, that there's there's horrendous stuff in the future. And Christ himself says, if, if God had not shortened those days, no one would be saved. On the other hand, uh, it's a fixed fight. Uh, the lamb versus the dragon. Uh, Arneon versus Therion. Uh, the, the bad beast and the, uh, and the innocent beast. The lamb wins. The hobbit wins. Mm. So, you, run loses. so there's no way around it. You ne- you're going to need supernatural faith unless you want to fall into despair. Yeah. Yeah, because all the indicators just look bleak. Yeah. For many of us. Expect it. Mm. You know, God, God sends you to a battlefield. He doesn't send you to a garden. Yeah. We're not in the Garden of Eden. We're not tending the garden. We're trying to save people from, from death, from spiritual death. Mm. How did you meet your wife? By a very <laughs> strange divine providence. Okay. I'm My college friend <clears throat> uh, had a sore neck. That's how I met my wife. Okay. He, uh, I went to college in uh, Michigan, Calvin College. I'm an ex-Calvinist. Uh, and my friend went to New York to find a job. Couldn't find a job. Spent a week looking. Uh, sat on a bench waiting for a bus to take him back to, to Michigan. He had an extra hour. And he uh, tried to, to look to the right where the employment office was. And uh, his neck hurt. So he turned to the left instead and saw a restaurant Mm -hmm. and said, I'm hungry. (laughs) So I'll go in the restaurant and eat before I go back. Uh, As he was entering the restaurant, the bus boy was uh, leaving. He just got fired because he had his hand in the till. Uh, So he said, hey, maybe, uh, maybe there's a job here for me. So he goes in and he gets a job. So now he's working at that restaurant. He meets the, uh, um, what is it called? Uh, The head waitress. Okay. Uh, and uh, sort of makes friends with her, and uh, she's a middle-aged lady, and she invites him home to meet his daughter, her daughter, uh, which he does, and uh-huh. starts dating her. Uh, this is the beginning of the summer. He calls me up in the middle of the summer and says, uh, Pete, just met a nice girl in New York. Uh, she's got a friend. Let's go on a double date. So we go on a double date. Where'd you go? Uh, <laughs> a restaurant, actually. Uh-huh. Uh, and uh, his date... Uh, Maria was really smart and really funny and very beautiful, and uh, and my date was very nice and very polite and 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 and, and sweet, uh, uh, good friend still, uh, oh, wow. but not, not nothing electric. Uh, so at that point, I wasn't thinking of romance or anything, but uh, uh, we had a, a date and. Uh, we went back to our uh, our homes. I lived in New Jersey, uh, and uh, I went to Yale in the fall for uh, graduate school. And I got a letter from my friend uh, who was back at Calvin uh, for another year, and said, uh, "Pete, remember that girl I was dating in New York? Uh, I think I got a good thing going here, but uh, <clears throat> I, I'm trying to keep the the romance going by by letter. Uh, why don't you write her a letter and tell her what a good guy I am?" <laughs> So I wrote Maria a letter saying, uh, what do you see in Sam anyway? Uh, What does he have that none of the other students in your college have? She was still going to college then. Uh, And she wrote me back a very funny letter saying, um, well, I think you can answer that question yourself if you realize that I go to an old girls college. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we became friends, literary friends. And she invited me uh, to go to New York and meet the family and, and, and whatnot. And at that point, I was thinking of becoming a priest and didn't have romance in mind, but uh, we became very good friends. And when I uh, got baptized into the Catholic Church, Maria was the only Catholic girl that I knew. So I asked her to be my godmother, and wow. she did. And uh, at the uh, a baptism, she joked with the priest, uh, hey, Father, suppose I fall in love with this guy. Uh, can you marry your godmother? He said, no. No, this is forbidden by the church. You got to get a special dispensation from Rome. The spiritual incest. Uh, you have to write to the Pope, uh, and he'll he'll say okay. 
Uh, so a year or two later, we go to the priest and say, Father, remember that question? <laughs> <laughs> meanwhile, so your Sam, wife is your godmother. Meanwhile, my friend Sam uh, started dating my ex-girlfriend at Calvin. Okay. And I started getting serious about Maria and said, this, that's the kind of father I want to be. Not a priest, but, a, yeah. but the other kind of father. So, so Maria, your wife my, is your I godmother. married my godmother. That's incredibly wonderful. Because my friend got a crick in his neck <laughs> <laughs> waiting for a bus in New York. <laughs> Divine Providence has an incredible sense of humor. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I often use this, this, this analogy. Uh, Pascal says that uh, history is uh, big things caused by little things, like mm. the inch of flesh on Cleopatra's nose. If it hadn't been there, Mark Antony would never have fallen in love with her. The Egyptian campaign wouldn't have happened. Yes. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Republic wouldn't have changed into an empire, and the whole history of Western civilization would have changed. Here's another so, one. Here's another one. Obama made fun of Trump at that dinner party, and then Roe versus Wade was overturned. <laughs> <laughs> there might be some connection there. Yeah, I think so. Well, 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 think of this. You exist probably because of some event like this. A squirrel dropped a, a nut on, uh, on a branch mm -hmm. uh, in a city park uh, in one October, and that nut fell in a pile of dry leaves and made a strange noise that attracted the attention of your great-grandfather who was sitting nearby, and he turned his head left rather than right to see what made that noise and noticed this pretty girl sitting on a bench across the way and said, don't go strike up a conversation with her and eat lunch with her. And one thing led to another, and they got married, and you existed because, because that branch was there directing the nut. <sighs> Yes. That's divine providence. <clears throat> how, old, how old were you when you proposed, and how did that happen? 21, I think. Okay. I just graduated. Maybe 22. I think I was 21 when I proposed as well. I proposed on the Staten Island Ferry, and I'm so clumsy, I almost dropped the ring overboard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a clumsy idiot with ADD. <laughs> so you kind of knelt down and... Almost uh, dropped it off the edge. Or? I didn't quite kneel down, but the, the ship was a little uh, <laughs> shaky. <laughs> a little shaky. And so was my heart. Oh, that's really great. Wow. What, what was the toughest thing about marriage? Kids. Really? I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll break your heart with love. Yeah. And, and they change everything. Are you, are you, no, you... no, absolutely no regrets. Yeah. But would you say you and Maria are good friends? Of course. Yeah. I mean, we've, every, everybody has, has differences, uh, and, and I'm from a quiet Dutch family <laughs> and an only child, and she's from a very loud, wild <laughs> Italian-Russian family. So it's like, uh, uh, oh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's like a cat and a dog getting married. Yeah. But, uh, but, but it has been, it has been everything. It's, it's, it's a mirror of, of a whole of life. And we deeply respect and, 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 and love each other and are, are totally committed. Mm -hmm. And from the beginning to the end, that's it. Do you think maybe that's the reason why we're having more divorces? People are getting into marriages thinking that if this doesn't work out, then I have an escape? Of course. Of course. Okay. Our, our, one of our favorite movies when we were dating was Divorce Italian Style. It was a, <laughs> a, a, a 50s comedy mm. about a... Uh, a guy who wanted to divorce his wife, but there was no divorce allowed in Italy at the time. So the only way you could divorce your life was by murder. Mm. So he hired a mafia hitman uh, to, to murder his wife. And uh, the hitman killed like six other women thinking that it was his wife. Uh, and we thought that was very funny because we, we said, you know, murder is more reasonable than divorce. Mm. Uh, so if we don't have instruments of uh, destruction in our house, we're going to stay married. <laughs> we'll kill each other before we'll divorce each other. Why is, why is that the case? Why, why is murder more reasonable than divorce? Is that because divorce is impossible? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a myth. It doesn't mm -hmm. exist. In, in the eyes of God, there is no such thing as divorce. Jesus clearly says that. Yeah. I often uh, have arguments with some of my Protestant friends who say that your church is authoritarian and, and tyrannical and whatnot. Uh, and I say, no, it's yours that, uh, uh, that claims more authority than Christ, because Christ clearly forbade divorce uh, in three of the four Gospels. Uh, and your church allows it, and mine doesn't. So you're correcting your master, and we're not. Hmm. Divorce is a superstition. Um, I've been thinking lately, it's... 
not terribly well thought out and it's not terribly insightful, but here's what I got. It's like you've got the concrete reality in front of you, which is disappointing because it's finite and mm. can't make you fully happy in this life. And then over here you have the idea. It's kind of what we talked about earlier with Marxism and uh, uh, the sexual revolution. Mm -hmm. Over here there's this kind of vague notion of what could be. Mm -hmm. Like I could be married to this woman or that woman or I could have different children or I could live in that country mm -hmm. or this state. Mm -hmm. And it's very tempting because it's vagueness kind of like the um, – uh, unmet Marxism that's never going to work out or sexual revolution kind of thing seems like this could possibly make me happy. But if you were to like take any of those scenarios, I'll have that woman in this country, in this house, and you actually lived it, you'd be disappointed again. The devil loves vagueness. Vagueness, yeah. That's in the screw tape letters. You know, dim the lights. That's his first principle. Don't have a realistic, honest understanding of the real world with all its limits live in, in in your fantasies yeah you can be whatever you want to be no you can't how is that different to wanting to read the lord of the rings to escape reality as it were or are you not doing that with the, the whole point of myth <laughs> is to plunge you into reality after you read the lord of the rings you understand the real world much better that's so true you understand the mythic nature of of objective reality Tolkien says in his essay on fairy stories that uh, uh, scientific truth is the friend, not the enemy of fantasy. If you don't understand what a prince is and what a frog is, you can't write a story about a frog who changes into a prince. Mm. I forget um, that line, but it's always the line stuck with me. I'm forgetting the context. It was um, Tom Bombadil who said to the hobbits of farmer, he spoke about farmer maggot in a way that challenged their view of him, that he was perhaps far more important than they had suspected. They had always just seen him as a crass farmer. Mm -hmm. And I love that because I think that's that's most of us, or all of us. We kind of walk around bumping into each other, wishing others would get out of the way so we can get in front of them. And How many friends uh, understood how important the Blessed Virgin Mary was? She was probably <sighs> utterly ordinary, like Mother Teresa, mm. like Dorothy Day. Two saints that I personally met. Tell us about that. And I was I was impressed by how extraordinarily ordinary both were. That's grandma. Wow. Um, it was Chesterton who said there's uh, nothing so extraordinary in all the world than an ordinary man, his ordinary wife, and their ordinary children. And that's that's the whole purpose of politics, to protect that. And if it's not doing that, it better not exist. That's right. What was it like meeting Mother Teresa? And where did you meet her? She came to our local parish. Uh, there was a big crowd, maybe 200 people waiting in line. And she saw how big the crowd was and uh, gave each person uh, maybe five seconds. Mm. And she just took my she, she simply shook my hand and said, God bless me. But she looked at me. And in that look, uh, I saw absolute and total attention. Nothing else existed in the world for her except me. Wow. And then I learned that other people who had met her had the same impression. Yes, I've had that impression with very holy people. Father Bob Bedard, who's the founder of the Companions of the Cross up in Ottawa, Canada, who's since deceased. I remember meeting him and feeling like everything else in the world slowed down and he was directly attentive you to me. You know who else I felt that with? Father Scanlon at, at uh, Steubenville really? University. Yeah. A living St. Francis. I, would I love, think he'll be canonized someday. Do you really? Why? The miracle that he did at the university. I mean, I, of course I've heard of it, and I just had Father Dave on the show to talk a bit about it, but I'd love to hear your perspective on it. Well, I know just what I've heard. I wasn't directly and personally involved in it, but he turned a failing school, failing in every way, uh, spiritually, academically, yeah. economically. I'm not uh, sure if you know this, but Franciscan at one point was on the Playboy top 10 party mm -hmm. universities. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's remarkable. And yeah. that's where he started. This is a Catholic university. You're going to be Catholics. So you're going to live as Catholics. And you're not going to have sex or drugs in the dorms. Mm -hmm. And we're going to fire all the atheists. And half the students left. And he said, so what? And he built it up from there. And now it's an Bless empire. Him. Yeah. I would have loved to have met him. The twinkle in his eyes reminded me of Mother Teresa's. Really? Yeah, I'd love to get to that point where I'm less distracted. But I'm incredibly distracted constantly. 
Well, heaven heals all ills, including ADD, <laughs> which you probably have because you're quite intelligent. Most intelligent people have ADD. But we, see, go into, we go into universities because that's the only place we can thrive. Yeah. We can't quite handle the real world. Yeah, I'd be screwed in a normal <laughs> job, I think. But um, it would be good to get to that place where we were more attentive to what's taking place now. It's like we always have this idea that God's will is this afternoon or tomorrow or next year or when the kids grow mm -hmm, up. Or mm -hmm. Well, Brother Lawrence has yeah. um, practiced the presence of God and um, de Cossade's uh, uh, abandonment to divine providence. Both talk about that, the sacrament of the present moment. Yeah. Yeah, the future may never enter into my soul. The past I leave into God's mercy. Mm. You, dear present, are all I have. How the devil loves to get us to worry about the future or to uh, resent the past. Doesn't want us to live in the present because that's where we meet God. That's where God is. Yes, the only There's place. no past or future to God. He's present. Yes. Yes. There's a, there's a line in one of Ingmar Bergman's movies Bergman was a, a, a haunted, uh, a God-haunted uh, agnostic. <clears throat> it's called Cries and Whispers. There's these three women uh, who are sisters, uh, and uh, they hate each other. And one of them is dying of cancer, and the other two can't wait for her to die because uh, she's rich and they're going to inherit her money. And the dying woman knows it. Uh, but uh, plays the game anyway. Mm. And uh, one spring, uh, I'm told that spring is 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 magical in Scandinavia because uh, the winters are so long. Uh, when the sun is shining and there's still some snow on the ground, but the green grass <coughs> is is poking through, uh, their two sisters take this dying woman out of her bed into uh, uh, the backyard swing. And they each sit on one side of her and she's swinging. Mm. And you hear the voiceover. Uh, you hear her thinking, yes, I know that uh, that my sisters are witches and, and hypocrites and they don't love me and they're just waiting for me to die. Uh, but that's the future. And mm -hmm. I know that I'm going to die very soon and I've accomplished nothing in my life uh, and I have nothing but pain to look forward to. But this moment, mm -hmm. this perfect yellow sunlight and this perfect green grass and this perfect white snow. That's all that exists right now. And that's where I am. And that's, that's it. Uh, and then they go back and she dies. But that, that one moment is like a light in the darkness, like, like that little star that Sam sees in Mordor. Mm. And uh, there's clouds all around, but one star peeks through the, uh, uh, the mm. fog and like a, uh, the shaft of an arrow, it smites, it smites his heart. Mm. Uh, it, it can't be put out, the light. A tiny little light will, will overcome a, oh, an enormous room of darkness. The darkness w cannot put out the light. The light always puts out the darkness. What do you mean smites his heart? I think I know, but... C.S. Lewis has a little epithet uh, that says... Uh, I forget the rhyme, but uh, the basic point of it is that, that, that the greatest task uh, that an artist can uh, succeed in performing is to break your heart. Mm -hmm. Isn't it strange that tears are the same thing that we shed when we have sorrow that we can't endure and we have yes. joy that we can't endure? <clears throat> yes. And bo both come from a broken heart. And uh, I think it's Paul Tournier who says somewhere that uh, the only heart that can be whole is a heart that has been broken. I mean, I think I know, well, I know exactly what this means, I, but I don't know if I can express it. Like I've, I've been in beautiful situations or have been engaged in beautiful experiences. And the thing, think the, but maybe I've got it wrong. The thing that kind of broke my heart was the fact that it, it wasn't what I wanted. Mm -hmm. Do you see? So yeah. the sun is setting and I'm surfing on this lovely beach in San Diego or I'm um, intimate with my wife or the most beautiful, you know, back porch whiskey chatting with good friends. And as soon as I think, oh, this is it, it, it fades away. That's C.S. Lewis. That's Zane Zuch. That's Is joy. that what you mean by smoting the heart or is that something yes. different? Yeah. Yes. Uh, appetizers. Uh, the smell of the steak rather than the snake. 
the smell of the coffee rather than the coffee. Yes. Or maybe not in that case. The pointing <laughs> finger. <laughs> yeah. That's why deconstructionism is so damaging. Uh, according to deconstructionism, ordinary words aren't even pointing fingers. Yeah. Uh, Archibald MacLeish's uh, Ars Poetica uh, defines that deconstructionist credo, uh, I think, as well as anything. He says, a poem must be palpable and mute, like globed fruit. A poem must not mean, but be. Oh. Nothing means anything. Nothing points to anything. No matter how transcendent the experience, it doesn't point to something beyond itself. That's all it is. And did he mean anything with those words about poetry not meaning anything? I think so. I think so. I think did he, he see is, the irony? I, I think he is a nihilist. Uh, he's a brilliant nihilist. Uh, JB is a great play, but it's a, a, a retelling of the book of Job, almost from the devil's point of view. Oh, really? I'm looking up one of my a, a poem that I found recently that I just absolutely loved. What's what's one of your favorite poems, and can you recite it? Lepanto, Chesterton's. <laughs> it's quite a long poem. Can you? <laughs> okay, good. And can you can you recite the whole thing? No, 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 no. Can no, you no, recite no. any poems? Uh, I played Hamlet once, so I can recite some of the soliloquies, but uh, I won't do that here. <laughs> um. Let's see if I can find this poem here. I love this poem because it's so humble. And I think you'll agree it's beautiful. It is by Edgar Albert Guest. He says, uh, The happiest nights I ever know are those when I have no place to go. And the missus says when the day is through, Tonight we haven't a thing to do. Oh, the joy of it and the peace untold of sitting round in my slippers old with my pipe and book in my easy chair knowing I needn't go anywhere, needn't hurry my evening meal meal, nor force the smiles that I do not feel, but can grab a book from a nearby shelf and drop all sham and be myself. Oh, the charm of it and the comfort rare, nothing on earth with it can compare. And I'm sorry for him who doesn't know the joy of having no place to go. Sam Gamgee said that in three words at the end of The Lord of the Rings when he comes back to his family he says, after well, all I'm... these adventures. Well, I'm back, he said. I, uh, when I finished that final three paragraphs i had to excuse myself from those i was reading it to and locked myself in my closet to weep yes because it's the end tolkien himself says uh, uh, i disagree with most of the critics who criticize my work but i must agree with one criticism of it it's far too short <coughs> it, it was that it was too short perhaps it's it, but it, it was it was it was the coming home. I mean, that, that bit about Frodo standing at the shore and the lapping of the water seeking, seeking deep into his heart and uh, uh, Sam riding home and, uh, and seeing the light inside. That was what it was. And, and, he, and this is the word. And he was expected. That broke yes, my heart. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. As Gandalf says, not, uh, not all tears are tears of sorrow. And even death can be a joy. But it's a... It's a a strange joy, a paradoxical joy, joy through the sorrow, through the loss. I have a friend who's dying right now, she has cancer's come back, and I've got my family asking me to pray for her, but I don't know, I kind of feel like, uh, what am I praying for here? That she'll be reconciled to You're God and die? Praying that the angels do their job and carry him to heaven. That's right. But um, it feels like sometimes uh, people are expecting us to be praying for cures and certainly God can bring that about. But I don't know, like at some no, point, like the, if faith, I, the it, faith is not a spiritual technology. It, it's not a how to do it thing. Yeah. It's not a, a, a press the right buttons and you'll get your miracle. Right. And I know it's about abandoning all to divine providence, but if I heard next week or next month that you would, you were sick, I don't know if I'd be praying for your healing. I'd be like, God, do what you need to do. Bring well, him close to you, help him to repent of his sin and to love yeah. you more than he ever has. Prepare well, him for death. Health is a good, and you should pray for the sick that they recover. Mm -hmm. uh, God doesn't like suffering for his own sake, but he uses it for higher reasons. Health is here for happiness, and happiness is here for holiness. So those, those are three levels, all of which are good, mm -hmm. but uh, the lower two are means to the end of the highest one. Mm. What was it like being interviewed by Jordan Peterson? That was a lot of fun. He's, How did that come about? Uh, uh, I had a student who um, 
knew uh, Peterson and respected him and mm -hmm. uh, thought that uh, this would be a, a match made in heaven. And it was, he, he's my second favorite interviewer after you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you should, you. you should have him on your show. <laughs> well, uh, he's well, a, he's a polymath. He's, he's coming, he's, he's on the verge of faith. He's got the content there, but not the personal yeah. God behind it. I heard somebody say recently, he believes in the crucifixion, but not the resurrection, which might be why he's so eloquent in talking of suffering. Well, I think he believes in the crucifixion, but maybe not in the one who's crucified mm. that, that, I thou relationship that specifically religious as distinct from mythological or, or theological dimension, I think is still missing, but uh, I think it's coming. It must be difficult being in his shoes where every conceivable religious group is vying for your attention and allegiance. I admire him for, for keeping his honesty and humility in that. I mean, he's enormous popularity. Yeah. Simply when did you first hear of him? Uh, I don't know. Various people, yeah. uh, and they and then all... what, what is it that you saw or read that impressed you? Because you said that to him in the interview, that, that you've appreciated his work or something to that effect. His honesty, his yeah. realism, yeah. his uh, insistence on not shifting responsibility to society or ideologies or anything else but taking responsibility for your for your mind and 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 for your for your life uh it, it's like like a father to a to a teenager who's who's dreaming too much mm. and he's he's very intelligent he's read all the right books well, well i mean i watched the first 20 minutes, it was the first conversation that I wished he had spoken less because I wanted to hear more of what you had to say. What was your favorite part of that conversation? Or His admission that uh, he has not made the transition from mythology to religion, uh, from a philosophical appreciation and uh, personal assimilation of the values of Christianity to belief that Christ is the Lord and the Savior and the master of his soul. Christ's ideas are already mastering his soul, but not his person, I think. Mm. I think that's inevitable, though. Why? Because he's on the right path? <clears throat> Once you're totally honest with yourself, you're sliding down in a certain direction, and it may be a, a twisty and turny sort of water slide, and you might even fall off the slide, but you're going to get back on again, mm -hmm. and eventually you'll get into that pool, and mm -hmm. there's only one pool at the bottom. Mm. Did you get much feedback from folks? Yeah, they all liked it. <clears throat> Are you an intentional, uh, uh, I was going to say Luddite, but that might sound a little, are you, do you intentionally withdraw from technology? Of course, of course. I, uh, we all withdraw from areas of life that uh, conquer us rather than that we can conquer. No, we don't. Sometimes we, well, we're willing to be conquered if it'll just oh, yes, shut up my desire for something better. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Yeah, like but, I want you to lose yourself in social media or technology is a way of kind of not existing for a while. Course, and if you don't like yourself, that's of helpful. Of course, of course. And and my students find it extremely difficult to uh, uh, to do what Pascal suggests: you know, spend an hour <laughs> alone with yourself without any diversions or distractions. It's terrifying. But uh, I th I think this is a a relatively benign disease in me. Uh, they, the whole of technology drives me mad, but not that mad. Uh, I've never met anybody that doesn't have one rather st strong is too weak a word, uh, remarkable defect and one remarkable talent. I mean, even the most ordinary people are better than most people at something yeah. and worse than most people at something. 
uh, I'm good at writing books uh, and I'm terrible at using machines. Okay. So it's not even a temptation for you to have to put energy in to resist. You just don't, you just don't care for it or don't understand it and therefore don't care for it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll use it and I'll, I'll, you know, master it insofar as I have to, mm -hmm. but uh, no more than that. I, I, I can't imagine why people are in love with abstract things like algorithms or metal things like computers mm. instead of, uh, instead of, Real things like a uh, like a cat that can come up and, and and rub against you and say I love you in a catty way. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do on a day off? What does your day look like? Uh, there's no one answer to that question. Uh, I respond to needs around me, and uh, if there's nothing more pressing to do. And there's good surf, which is very rare in the East. I'll, I'll go surfing. I uh, haven't done that in quite a while. Uh, been to the beach only once all summer. Uh, and if there's nothing more pressing to do, I'll go to my laptop and do another chapter in a book. I enjoy doing that because I, well, succeed. I think I do a fairly good job in it. And I don't mind doing household stuff, cooking and cleaning and, mm -hmm. and puttering and whatnot, yeah. Well, what if God said to you, I'd like you to tell me exactly what you'd like for just one day, and you're not allowed to say whatever you will, God. You have to, you have to come up with the perfect day at this stage in your life. He what would, would that look not like? say, I'm not allowed know, to say what experiment. Thomas Aquinas <laughs> said, only yourself, Lord. <laughs> I know, but I want to, I guess, okay, well, what I'm asking is, what, what would a perfect, okay, perfect, okay. You're going to have to uh, allow... Okay, God, turn me into Kelly Slater and give me a 20-foot <laughs> wave. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if it's because I'm getting older, but my ideal days involve sitting constantly, talking with people and reading. And Well, my ideal day would, in would include what I'm doing right now, interviewing with you. Hmm. Well, thanks. <laughs> I remember the first time I had you on the show, I was really nervous to speak to you. What? Yeah. That's ridiculous. Yeah. I'm nervous to speak to most uh, interviewers. Uh, um, you deal with that. I'm not nervous to speak to you oh, because glad. because there's no time pressure. That helps, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the goal. I mean, that's why I like to chat for a long time because usually it takes about half hour to get into a conversation. Yep. Yep. But what I like about you, and it's impressive to me, it's not a compliment. So you don't have to get your defenses up is that um, many people uh, who are older than, say, like 50 or 40 and 50, who've been on the speaking circuit, mm. have their answers. They have their ways of answering questions. And the ways that they answer them are very good, and that's why they keep saying the same thing. But I like having to just have a conversation with nothing planned. Well, I think ADD is a blessing in disguise <laughs> from God because I get bored, <coughs> bored with myself. Yeah. So I don't like packaged answers. Yeah. Uh, when I teach a given course, if I teach it 12 times, I'll teach 12 different courses. I won't teach the same uh, course. Okay. What's your favorite course to give? Even though, of course, a course on they're one always great different. Philosopher. Beg your pardon? A course on one great philosopher. Plato, uh, uh -huh. Augustine, Aquinas, Pascal. I thought you said one great philosopher. One at a time. Oh, I see, oh, I see go, what you go mean. Go deeply into a single... Wow. I think the best course I ever taught was the first time I taught Augustine's Confessions. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've taken three courses on Kierkegaard, two by experts, one by an amateur. The amateur's was, was by far the best. So at this point, I was an amateur about Augustine. I just reread the Confessions in the right translation, Sheets, mm. for the first time, fell in love with it, wanted to teach a course on it, even though I was far from an expert on it. And I got 12 students in a seminar who were also uh, in love with Augustine, the little bits of it that they, that they knew. And uh, we just went through the confessions, nothing else. We mm. didn't even finish the confessions. We got up to book 10, I think. Mm. Uh, and I think it was the best course I ever taught because the students asked for the privilege of writing uh, journals instead of uh, learned papers. And I said, wonderful idea. And uh, every single journal was at least 200 <laughs> pages long. Crikey. They really got into Augustine. I hope you didn't have to read all of that. I did. I enjoyed it. <laughs> did you? I can speed read. Can you? I heard somebody, it was Brian Regan, who said he's been getting really, his speed reading has increased 
but his comprehension has plummeted. <laughs> well, that usually is the compensation, yeah. <laughs> yes. But with student papers, that's all right. Yeah. Because if a student's brilliant on page two, they're usually going to be brilliant throughout the uh, the thing, and you can you can skip around. Oh yeah. What an what annoys you in uh, papers, students' papers? Predictability. Uh, merely factual interest. So and so was born in such and such, uh -huh. and he became yeah okay. Go, let me see your mind. Mm. How many books are you working on right now? A couple at once. Uh, one of them is a uh, an introduction to philosophy for beginners by the use of the Socratic method. Oh, excellent! And I'm going to write one uh, comparing the two greatest novels ever written, The Brothers Karamazov and The Lord of the Rings, Finding Common. I agree; in. those are the two best books ever written. I yep. think I would have said that too. Yeah, and finding commonalities in the two. Yeah. Oh, I'm interested now. Yeah, can I ask yeah. to give some of that away, or do you want to hold on to all that? <laughs> one of them is um, a Russian word, Zobornost which is usually translated universality or, or, or the, the, the cosmic dimension of divine providence. Uh, we are each responsible for all somehow. Yes, yes. That was one of the few ideas that radically changed my mind simply by reading a novel. Dostoevsky didn't prove it to me. He showed it to me in The Brothers Karamazov. Um, and you see it throughout The Lord of the Rings too. Well, how... It's Father Zosima who says this, isn't yes, he? Yes. I forget the context or who he says it to, but yes, Alyosha, perhaps. But how how is that displayed? How did how did Dostoevsky show that in the novel that we're responsible for all? Mainly by Alyosha, who practices it. Uh, he is an angel. Yeah. Uh, in his um, vocation, an angel means messenger, <clears throat> and he doesn't do much. He's a very ordinary person and nothing very spectacular, but he just talks to people, and he's the. He's the oil in the pistons that makes everybody else's engine run. Yeah. And what's so beautiful about Alyosha is how he treats, at least in the beginning and throughout the book, how he treats his father with, uh, he doesn't judge him. Yes. Uh, yes. He doesn't yeah, seem to judge a, anybody. He's a realist. He, he doesn't to... idealize him. Right. But he simply <clears throat> doesn't judge him. Yeah. And Dostoevsky's uh, letters show that, uh, that he was working on a sequel to the brothers Karamazov. He died before he could do it. Mm. And Alyosha was going to marry Lisa. Okay. And have a very uh, troubled life. Interesting. Well, that's that's another way in which Alyosha isn't the obvious hero, at least the way in which we might write a story today, in that he, he even just leaves the monastery and marries the cripple Lisa. Well, Dostoevsky says in his preface that Alyosha is a very strange hero. Uh, he is my hero. Yeah. But he's a very ordinary man, and yet he's eccentric, which means that eccentricity is ordinary. And most of us who are not eccentrics are extraordinary for lacking that oh, where is eccentricity. It? Let me let me grab it. I'm gonna grab I'm gonna grab you okay. keep talking. I'm gonna grab the uh, Dostoevsky's book over here. Good. <laughs> uh, one thing I was thinking while you were talking about teaching courses on single philosophers, it's kind of a you know, basic question, but what would what would you say your top three are and why if you had to pick top three mm -hmm. philosophers, top three books, top three top three courses? philosophers of the day. Of the day. What do well, you mean? I mean just today, what would you pick? Do you mean who lived today? Or? No, 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 just in Throughout general history. Top three. In other words, if, if an intelligent student who had never read any philosophy before came to me and said, tell me three philosophers I should read in order to cope with the issues of today. Sorry, I shouldn't I... have said today. I just meant in a, in a, to, to put like a levity to it. So like not for okay. your life, what would you choose as your absolute favorite philosopher? Just kind of like, which okay. ones do you like? If or I could have, have the complete works of A, B, and C on a desert island yeah. for the rest of my mm -hmm. life, who would I be? Well, I start with Plato. Mm -hmm. The dialogues of Plato are the, are the place to begin. Uh, I'd do Thomas Aquinas, who's the greatest philosopher of all time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think I'd do Augustine, mm -hmm. because he's the total head and the total heart combined, as no one else mm -hmm. has ever combined them. Mm -hmm. There's that section... Um, in the brothers, I, and it, it kind of speaks to what we've been addressing, right, about this desire for heaven now and not being able to get it and maybe wanting to kamikaze all the cherished relationships you have in order to find what doesn't exist. Um, who's uh, that's, that's also Tolstoy. Anna Karenina is a perfect example of that. I, 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 I said to this last time, I read half of it and got bored. 
which is my fault, clearly. I'm not blaming Tolstoy, <laughs> in case anyone's wondering. <laughs> yes. um, who's the fella who's... Uh, who, I, I forget the brother, because I haven't read this in a few years, who uh, wants Grushenka. Well, uh, of course, uh, Fyodor wants Grushenka. Well, yes, but... Well, and the, Dimitri wants Grushenka. It, okay, well, l l l I just want to read this to you, and I'd love you to comment on it, because this is one of the most beautiful parts in all the brothers for me that breaks my heart, right? With sinking soul, he waited every moment for Grushenka's decision and kept thinking that it would occur as if unexpectedly by inspiration. Suddenly she would tell him, take me, I'm yours forever, yeah. and it would all be over. He would snatch her up and take her to the end of the world at once. <laughs> oh, at once, take her far away as far as possible. If not to the end of the world, then somewhere to the end of Russia. <laughs> marry her there and settle down with her incognito so that no one would know anything about them, not here, not there, not anywhere. Then, oh, then a totally new life would begin at once. <laughs> he dreamed of the other, this renewed and now virtuous life. It must, it must be virtuous, ceaselessly and feverishly. He thirsted for this resurrection and renewal. The vile bog he had gotten stuck in of his own will burdened him too much, and like a great many men in such cases, he believed most of all in a change of place. Mm -hmm. If it only if it weren't for these people, if only it weren't for these circumstances, if only if only syndrome. If yes. only one could fly away from this cursed place, then everything would be reborn. That was what he believed in and what he longed for. Yes. Isn't that just yes. gorgeous and the human experience and idiotic and lovely all at once. Yes. And Dostoevsky's exaggerated characters, uh, like uh, Flannery O'Connor's grotesqueries, show us ourselves there. We see our own Dimitri. Yeah. We see our own Alyosha. We see our own Ivan. We see our own Fyodor. As Fyodor Dostoevsky saw, this is why he named his villain after himself. Hmm. Give me that book a minute. I want to find the... Uh, passage in the introduction where he's talking about eccentricity. Something I was thinking about Dimitri is, because they do end up, not to spoil, but they end up kind of going off together, except he's being sent off, I think, in, in a prison train. That's right. And she's being sent off to free him. So I think that, maybe this is reading too much into it, but I think it's funny that their epilogue is kind of like, well, now they're off somewhere together, either in prison or, you know, living their dream life. Okay. Like after they're kind of... Is that the, the epilogue? Is that when they... Is well, they, it's not... Are, I'm they, saying are the, they in Siberia at the end? Is is that... I, I'm always... I sometimes get crime and punishment mixed up. Did it, he get sent to Siberia? Yeah, it leaves, him, it leaves him being sent to Siberia, yeah. but uh, Grushenka is going after him yeah. with a plan to free him <sighs> from the prison, I believe. Yeah. If I'm remembering that right. And like Socrates in prison, uh, they bribe the guards and uh, arrange for him to be freed... Uh, and he does not accept it. Oh, really? I don't remember that part. Mm. I think there's that scene. I like this thing about uh, eccentricity because all of Dostoevsky's characters are eccentric. Starting out on the biography of my hero, Alexei Fyodorovich Karamazov, I find myself in some perplexity, namely that while I do call Alexei Fyodorovich my hero, still I myself know that he is by no means a great man. Mm. So that I can see the inevitable question, such as what is notable about your Alexei Fyodorovich, that you should choose him for your hero? What has he really done? To whom is he known? For what? Why should I, the reader, spend my time studying the facts of his life? Uh, one thing perhaps is, is rather doubtless. He is a strange man, even an odd one. But strangeness and oddity will sooner harm than justify any claim to attention, especially when everyone is striving to unite particulars and finding at least some general sense in the general senselessness, whereas an odd man is most often a particular and isolated case. Is not, not so. Odd man out. Mm. Now, if you do not agree with this last point, and if you reply not so or not always, then perhaps I shall take heart concerning the significance of my hero. Mm. Alexei Fyodorovich, for not only is an odd man not always a particular and isolated case, but on the contrary, it sometimes happened that it is precisely he, perhaps, who bears within himself the heart of the whole, while the other people of his age have, for some reason, been torn away from it, for a time by some kind of flooding wind. Here are two examples of odd people, Jesus Christ and Adolf Hitler. <laughs> 
there was a book written by uh, Max Picard uh, after the, the war, published in 1945, I believe, entitled The Hitler in Ourselves. If you don't see the potentiality for Hitler in you, it's something wrong with you. If That's you don't right. see the potentiality and the need for Christ that's you, right. You, we're, we're destined to be little Christ. What I said a moment ago about I don't trust any man who's been married for 15 minutes who doesn't feel the temptation at times to blow the whole thing yes, up. Yes, yes. And I've said that and, I've, and people have been very offended at that, like as if I must not love my wife. But it's just what you're saying there. Like, yeah, you, you have a Hitler in you. Well, I have no temptation to blow my wife or children up, but I have a temptation to blow things up. I have this dream of taking an axe and starting with every computer, uh, <laughs> destroying it mm. and laughing, and, and, then, <laughs> and then doing the same to, to the house. Uh, you know, I'm not that good a carpenter or a plumber or anything. And then to the whole of civilization. Mm. That's a very dark dream. It doesn't come to hating people but it comes to hating the limitations of the things that do not fulfill my dreams. So I understand that Dimitri passage that you, you just read. Yes. There's, there's got to be an ideal world. No, there isn't. Yes. You'd be bored with it. It's impossible. It's impossible to imagine heaven. Yeah. Because of the problem of boredom. Absolutely. Make a list of all the things you want to be in heaven. Done. All the things you don't want to be in heaven. Done. Imagine getting it. How long before you're bored? <laughs> not very long. Yeah. Like five years if I get breaks in between and naps. Yeah. I actually do find Socrates' response to his friends comforting when they talk about the afterlife. Uh, especially the bit about uh, if should there be nothing at all. Uh, maybe I'm not supposed to feel this way as a Christian, but um, okay, if there is nothing, and he says in the dialogue, that it would just be like a, a, like a, good a dreamless sleep. And who doesn't like that? Something to that effect. I didn't get that reaction. I was disappointed by that. I don't want to sleep. I want to be awake. Hmm. Dreamless, yeah, that's good. Dreams, dreams are an alternative to reality. But sleep is an image of death, and death is our last enemy. It's not our, Christ transforms it into our friend. It's like he converts Gollum. Mm. Mm. Dr. Kreeft, what's your favorite uh, platonic dialogue, if you had to pick The Gorgias. One? Okay, and then why? First time I taught that, I had a student who said that that dialogue changed his life. Mm. He was going to go into some prestigious <laughs> profession for the money and the power, and that uh, persuaded him to fundamentally change his values. The Gorgias is basically the argument of the Republic without all the political mm. details. And absurdities. Which is, which is the Republic's weakness. Yeah. So I, I think the Gorgias is an even better dialogue than the Republic. What about you? Is that the one with um, the, uh, I forget the word, but the, the, the fake philosophers that were around? The Sophist, yes. Yeah, the Sophist. Gorgias is the Sophist. The Sophist right. And he says that uh, uh, rhetoric is the supreme thing in life because you can get people to do whatever you want by persuasion. You don't even have to use uh, a physical force, uh, which, which is the genius of Machiavelli, too. Uh, Machiavelli understood for the first time the power of propaganda, a kind of uh, uh, spiritual warfare without mm. relying on the military. Uh, and it, it's a kind of proto-Nietzschean will to power, but, but uh, a kind of intellectual power rather than just physical power. And I think it's in the Gorgias, too, where, where uh, Socrates says it is, it is better to be on the receiving end of injustice and to, to lack that power than to do injustice and to have it. A hundred percent. Yeah. That's it's so evident. Most, I've, I've, most of us don't believe that. We go to movies and we're not shocked by sin. We're sucked by, shocked by suffering. Uh, but God yes. is not shocked by that. He uses suffering to deter us from sin. Well, I've heard you say before, right, that our problem is with moral evil more than it is with physical evil. And if you want proof of that, uh, what would you rather, your father doing the torturing or your father being tortured? That's an appeal to the deep heart. But on the surface, it's, it's, it's suffering that bothers the most. If sin bothers more than it did, we would do less of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great succinct go, go, way of putting go, go it. Go see any movie where there's a lot of both kinds of evil, and people are not shocked by the sins, they're shocked by the sufferings. Yeah.
Matt, do you have a favorite dialogue? Mine's the Plato to answer your question, or the the uh, Republic to answer your question. I uh, really like the last several dialogues, so I like the apology and what follows mm -hmm. from that. Yeah, mm -hmm. the apology is a masterpiece. Yeah, and I have one here. I like, uh, like Phaedo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that last scene in the Phaedo, after all the arguments are over, and the arguments are very clever, but I don't think they're very persuasive. Uh, when you see Socrates die. Uh, that's the supreme argument for life after death, because when the idea of Socrates and the idea of death meet in your mind in that death scene, when the two confront each other, Socrates in this corner, death in that corner, Socrates doesn't change. The meaning of death changes. Mm. And that's what happened with the resurrection too, although there it, it leaked out into the physical world. Mm, I like that, leaked out. He says, uh, the world perhaps does not see that those who rightly engage in philosophy study only dying and death. Mm -hmm. The philosopher <laughs> releases his soul from communion with his body so far as he can beyond all other men. I think this he means while we're in life. Well, the word body is the wrong word there. Uh, hmm. Passions, egotistic desires, that's the thing we have to die to. And every religion in the world has some version of that mystical death to the ego. That's very impressive. I mean, even Buddhism, which has no God, no life after death, and no soul, uh, insists on dying to egotism. Hmm. Have you been following, or do you try not to follow, uh, you know, church drama, German bishops trying to push sodomy and things like this? I don't try to follow it, but... It uh, follows me. <laughs> it follows me, and, and I think that... Uh, Schism would be a wonderful thing. Get rid of the dirty fruit. Yeah. Drop it from the tree. I mean, that, that's it's totally self-destructive. I don't mean this to be racist, but uh, some bad things have come out of Germany, mm. beginning with the uh, uh, the Enlightenment figures and obviously fascism. Uh, and Marx, of course, was German. So both the left and the right were tearing us apart. Uh, emerge from similar sources. So, uh, but 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 it's almost it's almost funny in a Monty Python sort of way. I thought it was a joke when they had a synod on synodality. Oh, <laughs> that's like having a meeting about having meetings. <laughs> like turtles all the way down. Or a, uh, <laughs> a committee on committees. Oh God, I couldn't think of anything worse. So you've written one book of fiction. Do you? Tinker with fiction, even if it's not for publication? I love fiction. I love reading it more than even I love philosophy, because life is fiction. <laughs> life is narrative, at least. Uh, but no, I will never write another uh, novel. It, uh, it took 20 years. Yeah. What about a short story? Do you ever try that? Yeah, there's a tiny little pseudo-mystical one in the appendix to one of my early books. I think it's Heaven, the Heart's Deepest Longing, uh, where nothing much happens externally, mm. but something happens internally. But I don't expect ever to write successful fiction, yeah. fiction that people will like. I, I, I have no formula. I'm not a Stephen King. Yeah, he seems to have a formula. Have you ever read a novella by Dostoevsky called A Gentle Creature? No. That destroyed me. Ooh. So I'd love to get, I'll Good get for it him. for you and I'll send it to you. It's, it's, um, it, it, it opens with a dead woman on a card table and her husband, uh, bewildered at what she's just killed herself. Uh, and it's made apparent on the first page. I'm not giving anything away. And he just recounts how they met and their life together and how he distanced himself from her to try to earn her respect and punished her and how he just like ruined the relationship. And I, I've never cried the way I cried after mm. I read that book. I don't know what it is with books. It's like every time I put a book down, I'm crying. You ever read The Road by... Uh, oh, yes, Cormac McCarthy. Destroyed me. Yes, yes. Like it was embarrassing He's how hard writer. I cried at that book. Did you, uh, did you read his Sunset Limited? No. Uh, a black ex-con rescues a, a uh, nihilist, atheist, overeducated uh, professor from a suicide attempt. Oh, I've seen the movie. Yes, Samuel Jackson. Jackson. What's it called? The movie? The Sunset uh, Limited. 
Yeah, you told me to watch that movie because I told you that I like movies with lots of dialogue. If there's not a lot of dialogue, I get bored. Yep. It's got to be good dialogue. Yep. And that sounds maybe a bit pretentious, but explosions in car chases bore the hell out of me. Yep. Yep. But I'm gripped. Maybe that's why I like doing this. Like I find this way more engaging, just talking and... I find movies that try to deal with philosophical or religious themes explicitly uh, embarrassingly bad. Like My Dinner with Andre, which people <clears throat> rave about, I thought was, as a philosopher, I thought it was really bad philosophy. And I've seen movies, religious movies by Christians where there's a lot of argument uh, and it doesn't work. In this one, it works because of the personalities. Yeah, they didn't. I mean, the black job. is nothing but his faith. He has nothing else. And the other guy has everything else. Yeah. It's like Job arguing with with Solomon in Ecclesiastes. I mean, and the black is Job, and and the professor is Solomon. Yeah, and how much better is the book? Um, it's it's exactly the same. It's oh. a totally faithful movie. Oh, I see. So it's basically a script. Almost almost never done. Wow. Which is also why I love Martin Scorsese's *The Silence*. Totally faithful to the book. Mm. Very very rare for a brilliant director. I tend to get. I think I've watched more movies where I've quit halfway through. Oh, than yeah, I've, me too. Yeah. Worst mm. movie I ever saw was the first version of The Lord of the Rings by Ralph Bakshi. <laughs> uh, if, 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 if you want to get angry at, <laughs> at, at artists, uh, try really? it. Is that the strange animated one or is this yeah, a different one? Yeah, the animated one. However, the first version of um, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe uh, was very well done, hmm. even though rather crude technologically. So here was my problem with the trilogy. And uh, again, the problems I mentioned to you prior to the show, C.S. Lewis's trilogy. The Space Trilogy. Right. Yeah. And just like my problem with Anna Karenina is clearly my problem because it's Tolstoy. Mm -hmm. Same thing, I'm sure, here with Lewis. Well, I, I sympathize with that. But even Dostoevsky, and as well as Tolstoy, uh, they say too much. And you have to have very pa great patience and, and a great memory mm. to get through the book. But once you're familiar with them the first time, the second time That's around right. is always better. That's why I recommend people read their novellas before their big work so that they can accustom right. themselves. So um, The Death of Ivan Ilyich is one of the most oh, gorgeous. That's, the that's an absolute masterpiece. I forced all of my children to make, I read it to them on a beach trip over three nights. <laughs> yes. <laughs> about a, yes. So it was a sunny Florida vacation. I was reading about a man dying. And they were forced to listen to it. It's <laughs> glorious. I've never seen death so well depicted. Yes. Yes. I would highly recommend everyone read that book now. Yeah. yeah. But um, what were we saying? Dostoevsky. Too much. C.S. Yes. Lewis trilogy. Oh, yeah, the trilogy. You so, have a problem with it. Again, the problem's me, and I'd love you to show me how that's the case. But I just don't like his fiction. I like The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I got a little bored with his other books of Narnia. Really? But this, but this trilogy, I just, I've, I had my elbows up against an, an imp, uh, a looming allegory that I was sure was about to come. It just felt, I know he said that there's no, alleg, it's not a story of allegory, yeah, yeah. but it was hard not to see, okay, these are yeah. the angels and this is the fallen race. I just didn't like how on the nose. Well, Tolkien didn't like it either, so you're in good company. <laughs> And you can't argue about that kind of taste. It's like music. That's right, and that's okay. Not everybody has the same taste yes, in music. Yes, 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 yes. So it's not a fault. It's uh, just where you are. Did you try Till We Have Faces, his best novel? I think you'd like that more. It's much more okay. psychological, Okay. much more modern. His wife helped him write it, which wow. is why it's so good. By the way, the uh, best written book that I wrote was the one my wife helped me write. Really? In fact, I sent it to Ignatius, one on angels. I sent it to Ignatius Press and Father Fessio said, how come your style improved so much? No. I did you not. That's amazing. The best letter I think I've ever received was a letter from you after I had asked you to endorse a short book on atheism. And you wrote back and went, this is very poorly written. Uh, you said, uh, I enjoyed you listening to you, so I was surprised at how bad this was. Loved it. I don't know if you remember that letter, but it made my day. <laughs> ah, there's a bit of a masochist in you then. <laughs> well, I'll take a beating from you. Other people, it may have offended me, but it was great because I rewrote it and sent it back to you and you actually endorsed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On Boston, Boston College letterhead. <laughs> now, I, I very much like writing. I like, uh, I like writing horror stories, little horror oh. stories. Huh. So Who's I, your favorite horror writer? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know if I have a favorite horror writer. I... Like uh, some of Lovecraft, mm. I really like Dracula. Uh, Bram, Bram Stoker. Yeah. Bram Stoker. The original That's, one. At least until it gets to the epistolary back and forths. Mm -hmm. So that first bit, 
uh, when he discovers who the Count is and him climbing down the wall like a spider and he encounters those women elsewhere in the castle. That's terrifying. Yeah. I remember reading this to my wife and feeling afraid. Mm -hmm. I haven't really had that experience with a lot of books, but I... Do you like Frankenstein? I didn't like that. Mm. Again, surely it's my problem. He just seems super melancholic and <laughs> I just found it like mm -hmm. boring, sad. Yeah. But maybe I should give it another shot. Yeah, you can't argue about uh, taste. Yeah. Have you read any Kafka? No. Kafka? No. You might like that. It's a little long. Who's but... Who's the William Shakespeare of ghost stories? I've read some of these lately. What is his bloody People name? People like Edgar Allan Poe. No, I like him, but... Yeah, I like Poe too. Poe's a great poet. And then I love Flannery O'Connor. My kids like her. My kids say, read the one where that old woman gets shot in the chest. And my wife bows her head and just in despair. And I'm like, all right, let's do it. Have you tried Walker Percy? I found him far too hung up on sex. Yeah, yeah. It seemed like he modern. had some sort of issue he was trying to work out. And try, I didn't like it. try a series of essays called Lost in the Cosmos. Okay. It's yeah, the yeah. funniest <laughs> philosophy book ever written. Really? It's a satire on pop psychology. Okay. Well, um... Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, though written from That's a fun. clearly atheistic point of view, is yeah. hilarious. Yeah. So is Monty Python, especially the Holy Grail. The, ho the Holy Grail. What's one of your favorite lines or scenes? I think the uh, the killer rabbit, <laughs> or maybe the, <laughs> holy, the holy hand grenade. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, they 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 had some brilliant things in there. No, it's not. It's just two halves of a coconut and you're banging them together. <laughs> <laughs> the Knights of Neat. <laughs> yes. Bring me a strawberry. I think more people have memorized the lines in that movie than almost any other one. Except the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I never watched that. Watched it once, didn't like it that yeah. much. Where did that come from? Like this, it was almost like it was just making fun of everything. Yeah. But it made fun of everything in a brilliant way. I mean, sometimes it didn't. But like, for example, uh, is this the right room for an argument? Like, that's really <laughs> clever and funny. Or that scene in The Life of Brian where that guard is correcting his the graffiti artist's yes. or the graffiti's Latin. Yes, like, that's yes. brilliant. Um, and the crucifixion scene where yes. Jesus is freaking pop psychology to the, to the dying thieves. Always look on that one. <laughs> <laughs> is, was, that, was that it? No, that wasn't Jesus. Was some, some people think the movie is blasphemous. I don't think so. It's not a satire on Christianity. It's a satire on modern pop psychology. Yeah. There are two, three times I've fallen out of my chair laughing uh, at movies. And, and one of them, I remember where I was when, All right, I am the Messiah. Now, <laughs> F off. I fell out of my chair and couldn't get up. I was laughing. <laughs> so Do you like Dr. Strangelove? I don't know if I've watched oh, it. That's one of the funniest movies ever made. Peter Sellers plays three parts. It's about new, it's about uh, the end of the world through a nuclear. I'm Holocaust. so excited! You told me this, Doctor Strange. Love. Let's see if you, I've seen uh, it. Doctor Crave. Have you heard the original ending for that movie? No. The, so the planned ending for that movie was for everyone in the in the hall to have a pie fight with each other, as an analogy, and they changed it at the very last minute because of um, I think it was the assassination of. Or no, what was it? Something to do with the president. They didn't want to make the presidency look bad or something like that. So they changed it at the last minute. But I love that ending. I wish they'd kept that or found some way to put it back in. I like the ending in the movie. How I, I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb? Yes. And you'd recommend I watch this? Oh, yes. It's, 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 it's I'm brilliant. so excited. Like Tell me some good movies. I'm so tired of turning on a movie and to get bored. Well, I Let's... think my favorite movie of all time, other than Dumb the and Dumber. Um, I'm uh, sure. Well, that, that's that's, funny. <laughs> that's that's truly funny. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Jim Carrey is a genius. But I think you've told uh, me. A, a Man for All Seasons. A Man for All Seasons. Yeah, that's an excellent uh, Liar, movie. Liar is one of the funniest movies ever made. Yeah. A Fish Called Wanda is yeah, another one. Yeah, that is quite funny. Um, I've been watching Hitchcock lately. I I've, I think I've kind of exhausted what I like in him. I've, I watched like Rope. The, that, that movie was excellent. Back Window, I think it was called. Rear Window, yeah. Rear Window, thank you. Not but bad. I tried watching Birds. Everyone said that was great. I didn't like that. I think Vertigo is his best. Yeah, that's what I've heard. But I didn't like, seem to like that either. There's something haunting about that. I just watched Armadeus. Mm, that was excellent. quite good. Excellent. 
Yeah. I like, um, what's the Bergman movie with the uh, uh, Antonius Block, the knight who comes back from the Crusades and faces death? Mm-mm. Uh, Don't know. I'm not a big movie person, I've got to say. I think movies are like science fiction. Most of them are trash, but uh, when when you get a good one, you get a very good one. Uh, ever read A Man for All Seasons? I haven't. I, I'm sorry. Ever read um, A Canticle for Leibowitz by Walter I'm so Miller? glad you asked that because I've, I've tried reading it. I've read the first two chapters and I, I want to keep reading it because everyone has been telling me to read this book. <clears throat> Only the first two chapters? Yeah, I just... You know, oh, wait. again, more about me than the no, book. No, no, I just no, lost no, interest. No, 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 no. That's like reading The Lord of the Rings <laughs> and stopping on page 50, where all you know is how the hobbits live in the Shire. All right. So read it. Well, let me, let, let me motivate you to do Please. so. Yeah. The protagonist, who is a rather dull person, dies on page 70 or something. And the book is 200 pages long. Mm. So what, get to at least that? Yes. All right. And it's a philosophy of history. It's almost allegorical. All right, I'll read it. C.S. Lewis said it's the greatest science fiction novel ever written. Oh, wow. When was it written? Like 60s, 70s? In the 60s. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the author, uh, who was a troubled young man, he, he reminds me of Cormac McCarthy, a very dark person. I think he committed suicide. Mm. Uh, he, uh, he wrote it in reparation for uh, bombing Monte Cassino. He was an aviator in World War II. Wow. And he dropped some of the bombs on the wow. monastery. Wow. Wow. I didn't realize that. And then I've been reading just uh, bad fiction that I enjoy lately. I just, I know it sounds like a contradicting myself, but there's a particular kind of series of uh, uh, cyberpunk noir type books oh. that are like nothing to write home about, but they pass the time and I've been enjoying that. Are you bored? Why are you reading? I'm not bored. Stuff that you don't really love. Um, I don't, I think it's kind of like uh, f- candy it's like candy. It's right, like I, so I, can't, I can't, I can't live off this. But so I'm, there's something attractive. There's something about attractive it. about it. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. It's it's written from a first person perspective, which I really like. Any good TV shows around? Lately? Is there? Have you watched any of the Lord of the Rings? I hear it's terrible. Well, the movie was was well. The movie was I thought was it was fine, good, but, but the uh, Amazon series has been released. I watched the first half hour, and I thought that the the technology was beautiful, stunningly yeah, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, it looked like Tolkien. But it wasn't Tolkien. It lacked his I, philosophy. I said, where is Tolkien in this? It's it's a totally different content. Yeah. And that, I was I was really surprised when there was that transgender uh, Muslim abortion Dr. Hobbit. I don't remember that in the books. I didn't get that. That was a joke. Part. It's a terrible joke. I'm sorry. Oh. I'm <laughs> I was <laughs> such is our day that we yeah, take that seriously. Just waiting. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh no, any good shows? Do you do you and your wife what do you do to spend time together? Do you watch a show or Yeah, usually the BBC or Masterpiece Theatre. Masterpiece Theatre. I don't know what that is. They have some good things. Yeah. Uh Grant do- Chester is a uh, very well done Grand uh, Chester. Okay, that's a TV about show a, about a uh, uh, an English cleric. Okay, uh, and his and his um, detective yes. friend. Any good? Uh, Doc Martin is very good. It's uh, uh, it's quirky. If if you like uh, Doc Martin, like the shoes. Oh, and it's this, about this a, is British as well, is it? Yeah. Do you ever watch the show Keeping Up Appearances? Oh, yeah. yeah. Wasn't funny. that delightful? Yeah. You know, there's a funny one on now. Uh, it's very shallow, but uh, but it's funny, called uh, Upstart Crow. It's a satire on Shakespeare. Okay. <laughs> Anything? Anything come to mind? I, I think you'll like it. If, if you like Monty Python. Upstart Crow. You know what else was excellent? I remember laughing a lot back in the day. It was Blackadder. 
Don't know that. You don't remember Blackadder with Rowan Atkinson and uh, Hugh Laurie? Oh, that was a that was a kind of classic BBC. Uh, I think it was must have been after was Monty, Monty Hugh Python. Hugh Laurie, Peter Laurie's son? I don't know. He Peter Laurie did a lot of black horror. Back okay, in the yeah, 30s. No, you know, yeah, Black Adder. I'm saying oh, Black Adder. Adder. Yeah, it's a scary TV show. No, about it's a, it's a, a com it's a comedy, oh. and it takes place in different uh, parts of history. Uh, it's like a kind of medieval ah. period and maybe so World like War II period. like 1066 and all that. Okay, I'm not sure. That's a very funny uh, take on uh, Western history. Jeeves and Wooster. Oh, oh, yes. I mean, yes. that's incredible comedy right there. Yes. Even my children love it. Yes. Yeah, I'll read it to them. That's so funny. You ever read Jeeves and Wooster? I would recommend everyone read Jeeves and Wooster. Yeah, that's brilliant writing. Let's take a break. And when we that's... come back, you know what a meme is? I, I know what I know what the word <laughs> means, but I can't identify one. I'm going to limits. show you several memes for you to respond to that you haven't okay. seen ahead of time. Some Good. might be offensive, but hopefully not too offensive. Good, I like that. Good. All right, thanks. I like question and answer. Hey, you there looking at me? You know what the number one Catholic app on the app stores? is Hallo, H-A-L-L-O-W. It's a prayer and meditation app which is faithful to the teachings of the Catholic Church and is incredibly well produced. Go check them out, hallo.com slash matt, two T's. Um, link is in the description below. If you go and download it on your phone, um, you got to start paying a small amount every month. But if you go to hallo.com slash matt, you can sign up and you'll get three months for free. It has sleep stories, one thing you might want to do, especially if you're a parent, they have sleep stories for kids. And so getting to play scripture to kids is super cool. Mm -hmm. Also, all of my lo-fi stuff is now over there. I'm just not interested, Matt, because I can't listen to your voice on that app. Well, you, oh, well, no. you could. Is that, is that the setup? <laughs> yeah, that's okay, setup. You can. <laughs> I don't know why you'd want to, but if you want to terrify yourself. I mean, if you, speaking of sibling horror, this is far more <laughs> creepy. If you want to listen to me read the Bible to you like this. And, you know, I wouldn't want that. Scott Hahn also does it. <laughs> yeah, so forget about me. Scott Hahn's there, Jason Everett, Jackie, uh, Francois. So go go check them out. Hallow.com slash Matt. Hallow, H-A-L-L-O-W dot com slash Matt. It's fantastic. And next, I want to say thank you to Parler. You guys have heard about Parler. It is social media the way it was meant to be. I'm over on Parler, so if you click the link in the description below, you can go see my profile and sign up over there. Being on Parler means freedom from reach affecting algorithms and shadow bans. Actually, one thing that's interesting is when I post something on Twitter versus when I post something on Parler, I actually get more engagement on Parler, even though I've got like 3,000 followers over there and who knows, 50,000 or something followers, I didn't even know, uh, over on Twitter. Um, so you actually get to reach more people because you're not getting banned. It means being free to speak your mind. It means freedom from cancel culture and freedom to grow. So go check out Parler. Click the link in the description below and sign up. Start following me if you want to. We're always posting the videos we're putting here. Uh, Parler knows what it's like to be canceled. They've been there, but they rose from the ashes, never wavering in their free speech mission. The reason is simple. They say that everyone's voices matter. So all on Parler are equal regardless of race, age, religion, politics, or dietary choice. Choices. Um, I don't know if that includes pineapple pizza, but yeah, you, it's not just like a conservative platform. It's just a con it's a platform for people who value free speech. So go check them out by clicking the link in the description below, and I'll see you over there.
All right, we're back. All right, so I know it's early, but it is Saturday. <laughs> That's an excuse for anything, right? <laughs> yes. And you were, you were saying last time, because I had that abominable peanut butter beer, I think it was, or Sweet Baby Jesus something is what it was called. And you said, why would you drink that? Yes. And I said, I don't know, but I wish I hadn't have brought it out. Mm, so we maybe have Guinness. You are a uh, we have holiday ale. Save that for later. Beer is too filling right now. I think I'll just uh, pass on that. Yep. Uh, we have two whiskeys. Which? Do you like a more peatier whiskey? Yes. Or, yep. Peaty. This is Lagavulin. This is my favorite. Mm. It tastes like drinking a campfire with salt water mixed in somehow. Well, that's not that's not peaty. That's a campfire with what about if it was burning peat? Huh? Oh, if you're burning peat, yeah, yes. there it would yes. Well, um, yeah. When I drank Lagavulin, I remember thinking this is the greatest thing I've. Do you like it? Yes, I do. Mm. The, the most peaty of all single malt scotches uh, has an O in it. What? Uh, <laughs> Lafroig. Oh, Lafroig, yeah. Yeah. Well, what so wanna, what, is, what is a meme? Well, How, I think meme may have been termed by Dawkins. Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell us what it is since you seem to know? I don't is, know. Is yeah. a meme a theme? Is it a sentence? Is it a paragraph? Is it an argument? Is it a <laughs> fact? What, what is a meme? It's like I would... Uh, uh, Liken it to like a genre uh, or like a form of media. So like a movie, a, a film, uh, uh, versus like a novel so or it's, so it's, a novella. So, um, so it's a, a, an artistic genre. Yeah, somewhat. It, essentially, though, it's it's just... How, how is it distinguished from other genres, like, uh, like a poem? It is generally a... <laughs> visu it's a visual medium. It's generally a image with some kind of text attached and usually a joke an image with a text <laughs> attached yeah it's usually an image with some kind of text if i it sounds like an advertisement how about i show you i'll show you about eight uh and then you tell me uh, what you think they are and whether you think they're funny so what we're going to do people are going to see what i'm showing you on the screen can you uh, throw mm. that up yeah just make sure it's working good to go. look good yeah. all right so I'm going to turn this this way for you to look at. Yeah. Ah! Oh, it was good to go, and then I. Oh, okay. A visual joke. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Is that is that working again? Sorry yeah, about that. Now we're back up. Good to go. All mm -hmm. right. So it says, "Did you know mm -hmm. the symbol M in McDonald's represents the first letter of McDonald's, which is M?" That's supposed to be funny. Hmm. It's supposed to be funny because it's clearly not funny, and and it's just wasted your time. That's why it's funny. I see. I see. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. Another one. <laughs> the guy at the church in Galatia who was circumcised the day before Paul's letter arrived. Now, that is funny. <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so a meme is a joke. Yeah. Uh, visual. But it's usually and coupled verbal. with a visual image mm -hmm. that's taken from. It's almost like that is a face. I don't know what that face is saying, but it is the <laughs> perfect depiction of disappointment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know? Yes. So when I saw that, this is one of the few memes that I actually laughed out loud to, in, as opposed to just blowing air out of my nose gently. Yes. My, my son, several times throughout the day, said, Dad, why are you laughing? <laughs> <laughs> so that, I think that's so far my all-time favorite meme. I, pay, I posted this on Facebook, and Scott Hahn responded and said, I don't think he'd be standing up. <laughs> See Genesis, something or other, yeah. <laughs> All right, okay, so, oh, this one's really small. But Matt Walsh says... Why did the trans man eat only salads? And the fellow who's dressed up like a Sheila says, don't say it. And Matt says, he was a her before. Uh, All right. Next one. Uh, puns, puns, the lowest form of humor. Uh, re read that. Read that out loud. Just speak into the microphone if you could, just so we can. Mm. The man in armor says, look what I invented. And he's holding up a loaf of bread. <laughs> And what looks like a woman in a gown says, that's the best thing since ripped up bread. And it is, in fact, ripped up bread. So it's not no, funny. It's, and it's funny. No, it is funny. That's, that's sliced bread. Yes. Right. 
So th- you know, when people see best... something, they say that's the best thing since <laughs> sliced, sliced bread. bread yes. Well, before sli- when they actually made sliced bread, the only thing you could compare it to was ripped up bread. All right, another one. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Is, is the joke the contrast or the identity between sliced and ripped up? I'm, I, I think it's funny because a common phrase is, it's the best thing since sliced bread. And well, so you wonder, well, if, well before if, sliced bread, the best thing you had was ripped up bread. Oh, so it's the contrast between yes. ripped up mm-hmm. bread and sliced bread. Yeah. Okay, I misinterpreted. Okay, gotcha. Another one? I admit that it's funny, but I'm not laughing. That's okay. Lord, Lord of the Rings, Rings, and then Lord of the Rings, but Legolas has a sniper rifle. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of a bow and arrow. Well, they put uh, uh, Legolas on a skateboard in, uh, uh, in that scene in, in Volume 2 where he <laughs> sails <goes> down. <laughs> yeah. But come on, that's really funny. Yeah. Le- Legolas was not, I think, a very successful character. Very hard to do elves. Yeah. He was, he was much too human. And he looked like one of the Backstreet Boys. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, he was... Well, but they were probably going for a more feminine look to try to make him seem otherworldly or something. All right, next one. Hey, says King Henry VIII, can I divorce my wife? The Pope, no, that's bad. Okay, watch this. (laughs) The Church of England! (laughs) (laughs) That is funny. (laughs) What's we, we, we that call font? It, that font. There's something about that font that says the Church of England, and I just <laughs> find it the Church of Henry's hormones. We mm-hmm. call it. Yeah, <laughs> that is funny. All right, I think I don't know how many I got left. I think that's it. Well, there's there's one more that's particularly offensive. I'll, I'll find that to share with you. But yeah, the oh, these are good too. You're allowed to tell offensive jokes on this show. I don't know how long I'll be here. All right, this isn't that good, but John Lennon, imagine there's no heaven. <laughs> God, imagine, imagine there's, there's no, no John, John Lennon. Lennon. Yes, that's like uh, uh, God is dead sign Nietzsche, Nietzsche is dead sign <laughs> God. Right. But, and then you might find this one funny. Not speaking English at mass. Check the connection. Oh, there it is. Traditionalists and charismatics coming together. Oh, yeah, okay, all right. I, I get it. No, all, right. Right. all right. So shall, now, shall, shall we share some tasteless jokes? Oh, uh, sure. Let's do that. You can take it Why off. Why don't cannibals <laughs> eat vegetables? Uh, why? They can't digest their wheelchairs. <laughs> oh, yes. That's, that's about the most tasteless joke no, I know. I told, uh, I told Neil a joke prior to the interview that was so tasteless that I would never repeat it on air, so I'll have to tell you that one after. All right. All right, let's see. So this, uh, this fella uh, somehow owns an elephant, and he's trying to raise some money, and so he decides to put out a challenge. He says, if you can make this elephant jump, I'll give you a million dollars. But it costs you, say, a thousand dollars to to step to step up to try to make him jump. And so people come from all over to try to make this elephant jump. They pay their money, but of course, no one can make him jump until one day this red Ferrari drives in, and this fella hops out of the car and he he pulls out a uh, uh, crowbar <laughs> and he walks up to the elephant and. Smacks him in the balls! And the elephant jumps. Mm-hmm. And so he gets a million dollars. And the other fella's out of money and he's really despondent. And he's wondering what other kind of test that he can come up with. And so he says, well, how about this? Um, elephants actually are incapable of moving their head from left to right. I don't know if you know that. That's a fact. Look it up. They can only kind of mm-hmm. go up and down. So he says, well, if you can make my elephant turn his head left and right, I will give you a million dollars. And people line up and he's beginning to make his money back when lo and behold, the fella in the red Ferrari shows up and he comes out with his crowbar and he says to the elephant, you remember me? The elephant says, (laughs) he says, you want me to do that again? (laughs) (laughs) I've been told by an Arab uh, about how you brick a camel. What does that mean? Well, camels uh, can... 
imbibe a lot of water for a long trip across the desert. And the more uh, water is in his tank, the longer the trip can be and the more profitable. So uh, when uh, uh, the Arabs t take their camels to the uh, oasis and have them drink water, uh, they fill their stomachs and they get an extra gallon by bricking the camel. Uh, with one, a brick in the right hand and a brick in the left hand, uh -huh. they sneak up behind the camel and squeeze its genitals. Wow. And the camel goes <laughs> and sucks up another gallon of water. <laughs> I like it. Um, you know the definition of a camel? No. A horse designed by a committee. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I have heard that. This, uh, this fella comes home from a day of golf and his wife says, uh, how was golf today? And he says, well, it was all right, but Gary died on, uh, on the second, uh, second green. She said, that's terrible. He said, that's not the worst part. From the, for the rest of the day, it was hit the ball, drag Gary, drag Gary, drag <laughs> Gary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's good. I probably, you and I have done this before, so I don't know if I know any more jokes that you would have heard. I told this one recently, so if everyone else can forgive me who's heard it, but and you stop me if you have. This fella shows up at a baseball game and he makes his way through the crowd and he takes a seat with his popcorn and his Coke and he's getting ready for the game. And all of a sudden, from up in the bleachers, he hears someone shout out, Hey, Wayne! And he's not sure who it is, so he stands up and he looks around. He scours the bleachers, but he can't see who it is. So he sits down and several minutes go by. Hey, Wayne! He's a little frustrated at this point. He stands up, he's... Looking for the life of him. He cannot spot the guy. A few minutes go by. Hey, Wayne! And the guy had had enough. And he stands up and he turns around and he shouts up to the bleachers, My name isn't Wayne! That's the end of the joke? Yeah. Oh, that's hilariously funny. Yeah. I can tell you liked it. Oh, it's, it's, <laughs> it, it has broken my heart. You know what's good about the joke, I think, is that... And it comes back to, like, G.K. Chesterton in Orthodoxy, where he talks about... People don't care about you. Mm. Like, why do you think everyone's looking at you? No one cares. That kind of idea, right? Where Wayne thinks the world's revolving around him and he thinks he's being summoned. But it... and, and that's actually supposed to be funny. Well, I found it funny, yeah. I like that joke. Do you? What's funny about it? Is it an anti-joke? Is that why? No, I don't think so. I think it's... Um... <laughs> Honestly, I think you told, you told it a lot better the last time you told it on the show, so everyone can go back to that. But I think that this time it wasn't unclear that he wasn't... That, it wasn't, you have, it's supposed to sound like he's calling at the person. He's yelling That's what at I was trying person. to say. Did you get that? Yeah. Versus. Still not funny. Yeah. <clears throat> Good. But. I thought um, God was going to come into it somehow. He, he was calling oh, away. Oh, yeah, no. No. But I, I think that. Um, I, I've told you that you go. Well, you're just expecting it to have some other thing of like, oh, he knows this person or there's it, some other way it's going to go. And then it's just. It this just general, changes. Like, the bait and switch is usually the key to good comedy. Yeah, that didn't have it. All right, what about this one? I think I've told you this before. Here's what's funny about the joke. My dad told, might stop me if you've heard it. My dad told my mum this joke while she was driving him home from work one day. And this bit's funnier than the joke itself. And uh, my mother found the joke so funny that she lost, she couldn't drive because she was crying. And my dad from the passenger seat had to steer the car. This sounds promising. It's not as good as it's going to, you think. But here it is. This fellow walks into a psychologist's office wearing uh, nothing but cling wrap. And the doctor says, well, clearly I can see your nuts. <laughs> <laughs> that was the joke. That's very cute. Yeah. Is that two jokes about testicles now, I think? Three. Because hmm. he had the camel. Hmm. I could compete with the stupidest joke. Yeah. Not the funniest one. <laughs> Man walks into a bar with a banana in his ear, <laughs> and uh, the bartender says, you have a banana in your ear. And he says, I can't hear what you're saying. I have a banana in my ear. <laughs> <laughs> That's simply stupid. I love that. That is actually terrific. <laughs> That's better than this one. What did Batman say to Robin before he jumped in the Batmobile? Hey, Robin, jump in the Batmobile. Ooh, clever. I mean, that, may be, really that, that may be the stupidest one. It's like the wet skunk joke. What no. do you call a skunk that's been left out in the rain? <laughs> a wet skunk. <laughs> what, is it, what is the difference between uh, skunk roadkill and lawyer roadkill? Oh, dear. What? <laughs> Skid marks in front of the skunk. <laughs> <laughs> so Norm MacDonald, do you ever listen to Norm MacDonald? He's no. since died, but uh, he's 
very vulgar in certain respects, but very, 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 very funny in others. <laughs> he says, um, yeah, I, I go into this uh, place and I ask for some Polish sausage. And the fella behind the counter says, are you Polish? He says, come on. Ah, these bloody racists. I ask for Polish sausage and you assume that I'm Polish. Do you see how, you see how, if I came in here, right, looking for Chinese food, I suppose you'd think I was Chinese, would you? You know, if I came in here looking for German, whatever, bratwurst, I suppose you'd think I was, I was German, would you, you know? Yeah, if I if I came in here looking for what Canadian bacon, I suppose you'd think you'd think I was Canadian, would you? You see, you know, like if I if I came in here <laughs> looking for Dutch, what do they have? Halverson hotspot. You'd probably think I was Dutch. This goes on for about five more minutes, mm. you understand. But I come in here looking for Polish sausage and you think I'm Polish. I think that's an outrage. And he says, well, sir, this, this is a hardware store. That's the joke. I see. <laughs> I think the joke is just to force you to sit through it. <laughs> yes, of course. Of course. It's like it's, the moth. It's, it's, it's sadistic. <laughs> I've would we would we get many... banned if we played the moth joke for Peter? Would we get uh, um, the I don't moth think joke? So. I'm not sure though. I can't guarantee it. It's a very funny joke. The mo well, in New York, it's a moth joke. Moth. Elsewhere, it's a moth joke. Mm. If I have a moth ball in this hand and a moth, moth ball, moth ball, moth yeah. ball in this hand, what do I have? A bloody big moth. <laughs> Four <laughs> testicle jokes. You're welcome. I've met many lawyers. Not one of them has ever told me a lawyer joke, <laughs> except one. Okay. Mary Ann Glennon, my favorite lawyer. Uh, I said, what's your favorite lawyer joke? She said, the uh, devil walks into a lawyer's office <laughs> uh, dressed in an Armani suit. And the lawyer says politely, what can I do for you, sir? And the devil says, no, 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 no. It's what I can do for you. I can make you richer than Bill Gates, more famous than Alan Dershowitz. All you have to do is sign this little contract, mm -hmm. uh, not even in blood, just with ink, uh, this little contract that gives me the rights to your eternal soul and that of your wife and children and grandchildren down through 30 generations. Mm -hmm. And he hands the lawyer a contract. The lawyer takes it, looks at it, reads it very carefully, every single line, all 12 pages, narrows his eyes suspiciously, says to the devil, I don't get it. What's the, what's the catch? <laughs> all right so here's some questions from our local ah, supporters good. and good if good. you guys are watching right now you can send a super chat in or go over to locals and ask your question cosmine petrilla says dr kraft he says dr kraft P peter so he might not understand dr peter kraft he should have said what are your habits as a writer how does a day in which you write look like do you write for hours or just a bit every day? Do you have a favorite place in which you do it? A favorite software, pen, jacket? Thank you for your work. I have no schedule. Uh, I <clears throat> write whenever I have free time, sometimes for only a few minutes, sometimes for a few hours. Uh, and the thing I love to sit on best is my own posterior. Mm. Nowhere in particular, though. Yeah, I have a desk yeah. uh, and a laptop. And some pretty pictures around. Well, well here's a question, because I think writing comes naturally to you. What would your advice be to someone who wants to get into writing? If you don't love it, don't get into it. If you do love it, just do it and do it more and more and throw 90% of it away. Yeah. The best advice I think I've ever gotten on writing was write drunk, edit sober. Hmm. Like, half, uh, half perspiration, half inspiration. <laughs> hmm. Or another person said, you, you don't try to varnish a boat while you're building it. So don't try to perfect the text as it's oh, yeah. coming out. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that is another point. Rewriting always improves it. Yeah. For me, when I write, I just have to dump it out because uh, working on something that's poorly written is easier than not having dump anything Dump it out written. as on the toilet. That's right. I just dump it that out. Says a on the toilet. That's actually where I write from. It's the only place I get peace in my house. 
Well, uh, that's very common, I think. <laughs> Magdala says, thank you for saying that divorce doesn't exist. That's what I've always, I always say too, and people usually oppose. And how would you explain to someone what is a sacrament of marriage and how does it differ from a civil marriage, for example? And what do you think about so many people trying to annul their allegedly sacramental marriages, justifying that they were too young or immature to marry? So a couple of questions there. Well, a marriage is made by God. A civil marriage is made by man. Uh, what God has joined together, no man can or should try to put asunder. That is why there is no divorce. Uh, God incarnate has told us that. That's non-negotiable. An annulment is not a divorce. An annulment is a declaration that there never was a valid marriage in the first place. Now, uh, how you figure out whether that was a valid marriage or not, and how fallible and infallible the church is in annulment cases, and how pervasive uh, uh, perversions of that process are, is a prudential question, which there's a wide range of opinions about. It seems that since uh, something like 90% of annulments in the United States and Europe get granted, mm. and something like uh, uh, <clears throat> 10 or 20% elsewhere in the world, there is uh, uh, something of cultural relativity here, and probably uh, some corruption. But the principles are very clear, and the Church cannot change those principles. Although the Church has never been very good, like most of us, at practicing its principles. In fact, that's one of the arguments for the uh, divine authority of the, of the church. I mean, any, any institution uh, peopled by such jackasses as us uh, would have gone under uh, long before 2,000 years. Very good. Sam says, how can we best change the lower and higher levels of Catholic education to help cultivate a wonder and openness to God? Practical tips appreciated. No practical tips. Just do it. Uh, you can't give what you don't have. So um, if you're concerned with your educational system, go into it and, uh, and show that, that wonder and that reverence. Uh, showing is more effective than telling. Uh, it's, it's, uh, the faith is something like measles. Uh, you catch it rather than teach it. Yeah. It's a good infection. Do you think, though, that some institutions aren't worth trying to salvage? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and a lot of uh, colleges have uh, declared that they are not Catholic colleges anymore because mm. they're honest and they say, we don't have or care for our Catholic identity. Good for them. Mm. I mean, an honest atheist has a better chance of going to heaven to, than a dishonest believer. Should Boston College do that? <coughs> no, or do Boston College is, remains a Catholic? is a confused... Uh, half secular, half Jesuit, half Catholic college, mm -hmm. and it has a, a an ongoing uh, honest identity crisis, and there are elements in it which want it to be less Catholic, and there are elements in it which want it to be more Catholic. And I find it a wonderful place to work because it's Catholic enough to feel home and and, and find some genuinely holy uh, and serious Jesuits there. But on the other hand, it's a mission field. Uh, and it's got serious problems, mm. as most Catholic places do. Kyle Whittington says, I recently gifted my mother a book you wrote to introduce her to your work. It led to a rather comical and awkward moment. When she first cracked open the book, Before I Go, the first thing she saw was the Oprah Piss Test. <laughs> I don't, you'll have to explain that to me. Now that Oprah... <laughs> is on her way to falling out of public consciousness. Is there another name in this day and age that would also make a great piss test? See, this is what's so great about you, uh, Dr. Craft, is that uh, you're so highly uh, regarded that uh, publishers apparently allow you to put Oprah piss test in your books. What does well, that mean? That publisher did anyway. Hmm. <laughs> That's right. Maybe not others. Well, my, the Oprah piss test is uh, if your book is not going to piss off Oprah, mm. if it's going to be endorsed by Oprah, then it is worthless because it says simply uh, platitudes, pop psychology, and what we already know and want to uh, be pat on the head for believing. So he says uh, now that she's kind of falling out of public consciousness, is there another name? What would be another name? Something piss test. Um, maybe Dr. Phil, although he has occasional good things yeah, to say. Yeah, I've been impressed with him lately in that he's had certain conservative voices on the show speak 
like Lila Rose, if you're familiar oh, with really? her. Oh, really? He had Lila Rose? It's an, it was an excellent <laughs> where she, she just destroyed the oh, I, pro-abortion I, 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 I repent of my yeah. sin of mentioning Dr. Phil in that uh, negative way for that. Are you familiar with Matt Walsh? <coughs> yes. Matt Walsh did an excellent documentary called um, what, is a woman? what is a Woman? Mm-hmm. And Dr. Phil had him on the show. Wonderful. To debate some people who thought they were the different, a different all right, sex. All right. I, I, yeah. I, re, I retract that. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Good. All right. Uh, Magda. Oh, no. I just said that. Said that. Said that. Okay. Before this, we leave yeah. that topic, I think the Pints of the Aquinas passes the Oprah Piss test, Matt. So maybe we could get certified. Put, yeah. How would I get certified? The Oprah Piss Does test. Does our show pass having, the test? Do we do pass the Oprah Piss test? Obviously. Okay. I mean, is there some certain, sort of award or certain things are self-evident? Certificate I could get put up. Any anyone who's who, who's on YouTube who's threatened with expulsion uh, has passed the Oprah piss test. <laughs> very good. Very good. Okay. Uh, Christian says this might seem like a silly question, but I would like to ask Dr. Peter Kraft whether every person has the same dignity. I learnt when you kill a priest, you have the sin of murder, but also the sin of something else. I forgot the term, maybe sacrilege. I have four kids. They're not the same. They all have distinctive personalities. And one day, one of them, I forget who, in the presence of the other three, asked, do you love me the most? And I said, yes, I do. And then I turned to the other three and said, I also love you the most, and I love you the most, and I love you the most. Yeah. Do we have equal dignity? Yes, because all infinities are equal. Do we have the same dignity? No, we have very different dignities. And some of that difference is hierarchical. And therefore, a priest has a higher kind of dignity than a, a, a lay person, mm. but not necessarily a, an unequal dignity. Because every, every, everyone is an absolute end, not a means to any other end. And that, that is the fundamental principle that gives every single human being yeah. uh, dignity. Dignity is not a, a measurable thing. You have this much dignity, but not quite that much. Yeah. Joe Ward says, I would like to know what Dr. Peter Kraft's favorite Bible translation is and any devotional reading he does, such as The Imitation of Christ. Well, this is very personal. Uh, I grew up uh, with the King James Version, and I love it, and it's a masterpiece. Uh, and I find that it's quite accurate, although it's in Elizabethan English. Uh, the same is true of the Douay Version. Uh, I think the Revised Standard Version, not the new one, uh, but the old one, is uh, the best compromise between contemporary intelligibility and accuracy. Uh, I once compared different uh, translations. I don't know Hebrew, but I know Greek. Uh, and I found, to my surprise, that the older translations were not only more beautiful and poetic, but also more accurate. I had anticipated that I would find the opposite, that modern scholars would be insensitive to poetry, but sensitive to scientific accuracy. But I found that the, uh, the translations, like even the New American Bible, which, yeah. is, which is very boring, not that bad, but it's pretty bad, uh, is deliberately off of, of the original Greek uh, whenever the original Greek is too poetic. There's a kind of allergic reaction to uh, too striking uh, 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 an expression in most modern translations. Also, if it has N in it for the word new, it's bound to be somewhat politically correct, mm-hmm. like inclusive language. So I'd say the RSV, Revised Standard Version, is uh, pretty much the best for most people, even though I, I love the King James the most. Mm. <clears throat> I love the King James too. I think it's very beautiful. I prefer it in its beauty over the Douay Rams. I find yeah, personally the Douay Rams a little too clunky, clunky in places. Yep. Um, any devotional reading other than the Bible that you use? I like simple things like the practice of the presence of God and uh, uh, abandonment to divine providence. Do you keep coming back, because that St. Lawrence book's quite short, do you keep coming back to that then? To its basic idea, yes. Yes. Uh, and to the book itself, because it is delightfully short. Yes. No, I, I, I keep coming back to the Bible itself. <laughs> Imagine that. The Psalms and the Gospels especially. Yeah. Um, I think it was Jose Maria Escriva who said, there are many devotions within the church's treasury. Choose only a few and be faithful to them. 
mm-hmm. which is, I think, very helpful advice to converts, especially who get overwhelmed by the cornucopia of yes. devotions on offer. Which is which is why the Rosary is one of my favorite prayers. I was thrilled to realize that John Paul II, a great genius, uh, also said the same thing. It's so simple. Mm. I mean. <sighs> Having a few close friends is so much better than having hundreds of non-close friends. So having a few perfect prayers, the Our Father, the, uh, yeah, that's uh, a good point. the, the Hail Mary, uh, it's like music. You want to sing it over and over again. As, as long as you don't think of it as theology, uh, as a science, uh, but rather as, uh, as music. <clears throat> music, uh, music uses and, and, and celebrates repetition. Hello, Dr. Craved. This comes from Thomas Augustine, probably not his real name. Your books are part of what brought me into Catholicism. I just finished your book, The Greatest Philosopher Who Ever Lived, and I was wondering if you have any advice on how to learn more about philosophy and keep the love of wisdom at the front instead of falling <coughs> into the dull and dryness that philosophy is usually associated with? Well, don't read contemporary analytic philosophers. Uh, read the classics, starting with Plato. Uh, let your heart, as well as your head, uh, guide you. Don't compromise either. Be like Augustine, whose statuary in the Middle Ages is always, almost always pictured as <coughs> having, having an open book in one hand and a burning heart in the other. Yeah. Colin Carr says, what advice do you have for fathers of young boys? How can I help facilitate an adventurous life with a deep love for the faith? Well, you've already done the first and most important thing. You've all already identified your vocation and, uh, uh, and, and your right attitude towards it. Uh, there are many good ways of being a father. That's right. Uh, find yours. Yeah. But of course, love them to death. Absolutely and uncompromisingly. Even when they're little buggers. Oh, yeah. And they're bound to be little buggers because you were one. Yeah. My uh, my mum has a funny story. She tells me that when uh, she would go to work and she would drop me off at my grandma's, sometimes my grandma would get so sick of my crying as a baby that she'd put me out the front under the veranda in like a pack and play and leave me there. And mum came home once from work and saw that this was happening and I was out there crying and... She said, don't bloody leave him out there. Someone could steal him. And she said, well, put it this way. Would you steal your kid? <laughs> <laughs> My father once told me a story. He had uh, done something bad and destructive. And his father, uh, his father died when my father was only 12. So he must have been under 12 at the time. Uh, they were very poor and they were peasants. And they, uh, the family had just immigrated from, from Holland. Uh, and uh, so his punishment was to, uh, uh, to sleep in the chicken coop with the chickens. And it was summertime, so it was not a, not a problem. Mm-hmm. And uh, my father slept with the chickens, and he said, uh, I kind of thought of it as an adventure. Mm-hmm. So when, uh, when his father rescued him in the morning, he said, uh, you're not going to do that again, are you? He said, uh, yeah, I like sleeping with the chickens. What a boy. <laughs> <laughs> Every morning almost, my Daughters ask, can we go to such and such house so that we can be with their babies? Hmm. And every morning my son wants to kill something. Mm-hmm. So I took him, we butchered some chickens. He was happy, so happy. And it's, uh, I know that not all boys express that desire to kill, nor do all girls express a desire to uh, mother children, but it's beautiful to see. But very few girls want to uh, kill chickens and very few boys want to be around babies. Yeah. But that's okay. There are tomboys and tom girls. That's right. My wife and I have spoken about this, about how my wife was a tomboy, Mm -hmm. uh, very much so. She was captain of the wrestling team in Mm -hmm. high school. She was big into soccer in Mm -hmm. primary school. And that if she lived today, how sad it is that many people, instead of uh, uh, relishing in the uh, uniqueness of her personality, Mm -hmm. perhaps would have sought to give her hormones or surgeries or something. I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic with one aspect of the, uh, the far left uh, in sexuality, namely its attack on social stereotypes. They do a lot of harm. If you're not Doris Day, you're not a woman. If you're not John Wayne, you're not a man. But I don't think that is their attack because look at their drag queens that yeah. they 
I mean, it's it's like a it's a it's a monster of what femininity yeah. ought to be. Yeah. So it's almost like uh, the nuance the the nuance of the sexual landscape has been has been made black or white in the transgender proponents' yeah. mind. Well, that's the difference between the old liberalism and the new. Yeah. The old the old wanted more openness and more freedom, and that's a mm. legitimate uh, desire. The uh, the new wants to attack nature. One of the best insights I've got from Nietzsche, and I'd love you to comment on this, is his idea of resentiment where we demonize that which we believe ourselves impotent to attain. Most psychologists would agree with that. That's, now, that's, now he, that's... he attributed Christians and Christ, I think, and Socrates and in, in that camp. We wouldn't do that. Yeah. But I love the idea yeah. that if I feel myself impotent to attain whatever, being a good father, getting married, uh, then I demonize those marriages so that I can seem... This is why Nietzsche hated uh, total egalitarianism. He would never have made a Marxist. Sartre and Nietzsche are probably the two most brilliant and passionate atheists of all time, but Sartre became a Marxist. Nietzsche would never have become a Marxist. That, uh, that refusal uh, to stand out, that refusal of, of any kind of excellence, <coughs> even the excellence of evil, uh, something you uh, have to admire Nietzsche for. We have a super chat here, thank you, from Mug, who says, Do you have a favorite genre of music, Dr. Kraft? Also, did you publish that book on humor? We really yes. enjoyed your talk at the University of Dallas. Oh, thank you. That was, that was the talk that persuaded me to publish the book on humor. It'll be out in, I think, a few months. Uh, it's called Ha. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I... <laughs> I wasn't reluctant to do it because I'm not a stand-up comedian or anything of the sort, uh, but I gave a talk at the University of Dallas, and it was by far the most successful talk I ever made in my life. The, the audience loved it. Really? Uh, and I said at the beginning, this is going to be an experiment. If, uh, if you react uh, well to this talk, I will reconsider my uh, intention not to publish the book. And they made me publish the book, so he's part of that. What so was the other part of the question, which I forgot? Um, let me find it. Sorry. There's a bunch here. Not to spoil another one of your books, but what do you, what do you think makes something funny or not? Is that an answerable question? Read my book. There are more than one answer to that question. And the book again is called? Ha. Ha. And it's out. No, it's uh, at the publisher. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, Gavin says, I'm very interested to hear Peter's stance on lying. I also just wanted to ask what he thinks about double effect and how that can work in self-defense, but not in lying, since the means are evil in lying. You cannot unintentionally lie, but you should intend to not kill the person. Lying is a more relative thing than most evils because it's essentially an interpersonal relationship. You lie to another person, either to, uh, that is, you, 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 you deceive, you deliberately deceive another person, either to protect that person or to harm that person. So I don't think that lying to another person to protect him is a bad thing. Suppose, for instance, uh, your father. Uh, I think it is. I, I'm, I've come to well, that. I'd love you to try and talk me out of that, but. Okay, you're a Dutchman, you're hiding Jews in the attic from yeah. the Nazis. The Nazis come to your door, yes. and they say, do you have any Jews here? I think you're, you're, what ordinary people would call lying, if you use that definition, I think your moral obligation is to lie to the Nazis, because you promised to the Jews to hide them. And hiding is a kind of lying. So you promised to lie, and you must well, fulfill that promise, because that... That lie will not only save the lives of the Jews, but save the Germans who want to kill them from an additional sin, and therefore perhaps shorten their purgatory. I think we should define lying and then stick to that definition. So if lying is speaking a falsehood with the intention of deceiving, then I wouldn't say that hiding is a type of lying. I would. I would. Sometimes deception is good. Is a not... head fake in basketball a sin? Is a head fake in mm. basketball a sin? I don't, yeah, I've heard different objections like this, sort of like similar in football to sort of uh, to deceive somebody and then go another way. I don't know about that, but I do feel strongly that I should never speak a falsehood with the intent of deceiving. 
And I, I, I think, but, I think but, you have to add, I think you have to add to the other person's harm or to someone's harm. But Aquinas, I mean, Aquinas isn't infallible, <clears throat> but he doesn't do that. And he would disagree with you, as would Augustine, as would Bonaventure. I think he would, uh, in principle. But I don't think he would uh, open the door and say to the Nazis, yes, alas, I have some Jews in the attic and I know you want to kill, to kill them, right. but I can't stop you, so come in. Hear me out here then. Because I, I think when people think of the Nazi at the door example, they think, okay, it's understandable that you would lie to save the Jews. And then I want to say to them, what is another sin... And you may not say that lying is lying in that it's situation, but let's say it is. What is a, another sin that is generally believed to be intrinsically evil that you think would be permissible? Oh, that's easy. Killing. Killing a but human, killing isn't killing intrinsically a human evil. being made in the image of God whose life is intrinsically valuable. But that's not an intrinsic evil to kill. That's right. And, but you're, so in you're, fact, the commandment doesn't say thou shalt not kill. It says thou shalt not murder. Right. So what I'm asking, though, is there any... Okay, I'm going to use an example that's going to seem crass, but this is a, mm. this is a thought experiment. But suppose the, uh, the, uh, the Nazis came to your door and said, uh, we'd like you to fornicate with this woman, and if you don't, we're going to kill everybody in the basement. You don't do it. Yeah, you don't do it. That's right. What about masturbate? No, you don't do it. What about... Certainly not blasphemy. You don't, do, okay, you don't do any intrinsic evil. And but you just don't think lying is intrinsically evil. That's right. Or if, you think if it by is. Lying, if by yeah. lying, you don't include to someone's harm. If you simply say deliberately deceive, I think there are countless examples in ordinary life where you're morally obligated to deliberately deceive. Yeah, I don't think that. Well, then is the evil lying or the, or the deliberately harming someone? There's, there's an enemy attacking you, and you're, you're protecting your family. Uh, and in order to protect your family, you have to deliberately deceive the attacker. Yes, and I would do that. Of course you would. Yes. Gandhi himself said that he, he would, in some circumstances, kill to protect his family. If a, if a murderer, uh, I don't know the exact quote, but if a murderer came into my mm -hmm. room and started killing my children... And the only way I could protect my other children from, from, from harm That's interesting. would be by the disabling Gandhi would have him. Said that. Yeah. He said, I, I would, without any hate in my heart and without <laughs> any intent to harm, put up a shield. And if the only shield I could put up was, uh, was an arrow that would, uh, would disable him and perhaps kill him, I yeah. would still do it. This is part of Aquinas' just war theory, isn't it? Yeah. I think Aquinas is perfectly right about the just war theory. So what do you think about this then, right? The reason we think that contraception is intrinsically evil is it thwarts the end of the sexual act. Um, what if the end of the act of speech is to communicate what is? That's not the only end of speech. Right. The, the, the end That's right. And, and, the, and, the, and, and, and procreation isn't the only end of sex, but it is a end. And to deliberately deceive you with my speech seems to thwart the end of speech, doesn't it? it? Doesn't it? Yes, yes, and I'm not sure what the logical, philosophical, theoretical answer to that question is, but I am quite sure that you do not uh, reveal to the Nazis that's where right. the Jews are. Mm. Now, if you call that lying, fine. If you say, no, sure. that's not lying, fine. I think that's... that's I think that's a matter of what, what language you choose. I, I think that's a typical example of a, a question that seems to be a real question, but it really isn't. Uh, I think Kant uh, would go so far as to say, I would not even deceive the Nazis. I mean, uh, he, he's a, a, a literalist and a rationalist and a, and a kind of a stoic. But I think ordinary people would say, of course you deliberately deceive him here. But ordinary people get a lot of things wrong. Well, that's true. That's true. And, uh, and, and a lot of things seem right to us that aren't. So I, 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 tell me, I think that this is like a, a, an epistemologically reputable position to hold. Namely, if people much smarter and holier than me disagree with me and I don't know fully how to refute them, I'll go with them until mm -hmm. I learn otherwise. Yeah, that's called trust. Yeah. Or faith. So, so that's where and, I am right and, now. And faith yeah. has a very large part to play in our secular lives, which we don't usually recognize. That's right, yeah. On the other hand, when the authorities contradict, 
when you have oh, yes. Aquinas and Kant on the one hand and uh, many others on the other hand, uh, then you're confused. I, uh, I hosted a debate, which you would love. It's between a Dominican, very brilliant young Dominican, Father Gregory Pine uh, from the Eastern Province, and um, Janet Smith. Oh, it two was wonderful people. Two wonderful people. And whenever one of them stopped speaking, I thought they were right. <laughs> yes, <laughs> That's just yes, good, you know? yes, yes. I love the Dominicans. You know the difference between a Dominican and a Jesuit, don't you? Uh, what? Well, the... Uh, Dominicans were founded by St. Dominic in the 12th century in order to combat the heresy of Albigensianism. That's right. And the Jesuits were founded by St. Ignatius Loyola in the 16th century to combat the heresy of Protestantism. Now, tell me, me how many Albigensians have you met lately? <laughs> I've heard you say that before. It's good. Um, oh, I've read that about that was Gavin's question. How can I learn to suffer well, says oh, Rutger Dumm. that's Dumb. a very good question. Uh, you've already done the first thing. You realize that there is good suffering and bad suffering. That suffering is a an act, or your attitude toward suffering is an act, a choice on your part. Uh, and you also implicitly recognize that God has deliberately allowed this suffering to come into your life. God doesn't hate you, doesn't want you to suffer, doesn't will suffering directly, but allows evil. Why? Because he is working it for a greater good. The only, the only reason uh, the God who loves you allows suffering into your life is because he loves you. Because this has the potentiality of working out for a greater good, if you trust him. And if you say, your will be done no matter what, if that's your absolute. If your absolute is your own pleasure and not suffering, that's a different absolute. But if your absolute is God knows best, that is his will, well, then you struggle to somehow... See that suffering by faith. You don't usually see it by reason, and certainly not at the time that you're suffering, but you struggle to see that as somehow part of his perfect will for you. And insofar as you can see that, it is possible for you to say yes to your suffering mm. and to offer it up. We've already discussed this, but I'd like you to take another swing at it, if you will. I. Moulton says, what did Dr. Crave think of his conversation with Dr. Peterson? I enjoyed it very much. I uh, have a very high opinion of Dr. Peterson. I think he's uh, uh, just what our society needs. He's not complete, but he's got a lot of great stuff to say. Yeah, when people are honest and vulnerable, yep. you'll if you watch several videos of his, you'll see him. He listens, cry, tear up. Yes. Like he's he doesn't have he, his, he doesn't seem to have his defenses up a lot of the time in in interview settings. He, did a, he was here at the university. Do you know that, speaking? No, I didn't know that. He, the first time he ever went to Holy Mass was here at Franciscan on Ooh, campus. Wow. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. He and never went to Mass before? Never. That's it was his surprising. first time. And um, doc, uh, Father Dave took him to the Adoration Chapel, that little chapel we have up on campus, and was explaining to Dr. Peterson that Catholics view the Eucharist as more than merely symbolic. And Dr. Peterson stood, stopped in his tracks and said, and what's wrong with a symbol? And Father Dave said, ah. well, I, I, pr I presume that all those coming to your lecture tonight would be pretty disappointed if they just got a hologram of Dr. Peterson. <laughs> and he went, fair enough. Touche. Isn't Touché. that good? Yes. I had a Muslim student once who uh, asked to go to Mass with me. He'd never been mm. to Mass before. And he was very reverent. He sat. He did not stand or pray or anything, but uh, he was very careful. And afterwards, uh, he said to me, you, uh, you Catholics believe that that little piece of bread uh, is really Jesus Christ, literally. I said, yes. And he said, you as Christians believe that Jesus Christ is God, fully divine. I said, yes. And he says, I don't think you believe that. And I said to him, uh, well, I don't expect you to find yourself uh, able to believe that. It's a difficult thing to believe. It's a great mystery. She said, no, 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 you're misunderstanding me. Uh, I'm not saying anything about, uh, uh, about you. Uh, I'm not saying that you're hypocrites and you don't really believe what you say you believe. Uh, and I'm not saying that you, you don't believe it, but I'm... I, I'm saying that, well, if, if maybe I am, and, and then he changed, and he said, maybe I am saying something about you, because 
I'm putting myself in your shoes and I'm saying, suppose I were a Christian and a Catholic and I believed that Jesus was Allah himself in the flesh and that that flesh was really what was going on in that apparent piece of bread. If, if I believed that, uh, and then he hesitated, and I said, you couldn't imagine yourself getting down on your knees like all those Catholics did at the moment of consecration. He said, no, I couldn't imagine myself ever getting up again for the rest of my life. I was very impressed by that. Yeah. It's a good answer, but um, do you think it's... Do you think it's the right answer? Because surely no, the Eucharist no. is truly no, no, Christ, and surely Christ doesn't want us to get on our knees and knock it off again. So, no, no, obviously not. But I, it's an excellent insight for sure. I also heard a Protestant once say, "If I truly believe that was Jesus Christ, I'd crawl over broken glass daily to receive him." Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Well, it's 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 like Christ Himself. It's it's either or. I mean, if he's if he's not God, he's the the most blasphemous person in history. And if that's not Jesus Christ, then Catholics are the most ridiculous idolaters in history, mm -hmm. confusing uh, what's only a little cookie with, with Almighty God. Yeah. Colin asks, what advice do you have for fathers of... Oh, no, I asked that, sorry. How can I continue, he says, to fall in love with the faith? Now that I'm entering my 30s, I feel like I'm losing the romance I had with the church in college. And I'll just add to that, I think, a line from Chesterton who said something like, let your faith be more of a romance and less of, or mm. more more of a love affair, less of a syllogism, mm. or something to that effect. Mm. Don't try to squeeze Christ out of the church as you squeeze orange juice out of an orange. You get the church from Christ, not vice versa. So first, you have to fall in love with Christ, and since the church is His body, you must fall in love with the church, even though she is uh, an unfaithful whore. Yeah, but she's she is. His whore. His whore. Yes. <laughs> I am his whore. What do you think about that? T-shirts. Never saw that. Pretty good. <laughs> Very good. Um, so I want to invite people, if you want to enter questions into the chat, Neil, maybe you can pass mm -hmm. up through some of them. And uh, if there are any really good ones, we'll, we'll ask them. But I was thinking if you're open to it, I would like to read um, a respondio from whether the existence of God is self-evident to okay. see your opinion on the ontological argument. Is that okay? Fine. Do you want to sum up the ontological argument first? Yes. Do you want me to? Yeah. Yes. Best way of summing it up, up, I think, is apparently we have to define the word God before we can talk intelligently about him. And the best definition of the word God is Anselm's, the negative definition. God is that than which nothing greater can be conceived. If you can conceive of something greater than X, then X is not God. All right, let's accept that definition. Now, if God does not exist, then I can conceive of a God that has all the other attributes that you say you disbelieve in, uh, a being that's omniscient and omnipotent and omnibenevolent and all other conceivable perfections, but lacks real existence outside the mind. He's a figment of our imagination. He's, uh, uh, he's lacking only the, uh, the attribute of objective existence, which is, of course, a perfection, because it's better to exist uh, outside the mind than dependent upon the mind. Well, then, if in order to be an atheist you have to define God in the way that the theist does, and of course you must in order to deny that God, mm. uh, then you're contradicting yourself in saying that God who by definition lacks no perfection, lacks this one perfection. So atheism is self-contradictory, and therefore theism is self-evident. Now that's, like, a, that's a good argument, although it's, I think it's not valid, and I think Aquinas is, is right in re rejecting that as an argument. What's fascinating, too, is if you go online, you'll find atheists impugning Aquinas and saying he's not a true philosopher, he's merely an apologist for whatever the church teaches. That's clearly not true, since mm -hmm. this, I think, it, it could be argued, is the most prominent argument for God's existence in the Christian tradition. Actually, there's another one, well, too. It's, the, it's not the, the most prominent in the sense that it's the most popularly accepted, but it is the most argued about. There is no argument in the whole history of philosophy that's, mo that's more argued about than the ontological argument. But what would be another argument prior to Aquinas not including Bonaventure and not taking into account the sort of uh, Islamic tradition that would be as prominent an argument oh, for God's existence. Oh, the moral argument. 
in, in, in which that. philosophers? If, if, if there is an absolute moral law, there must be an absolute moral law but giver. Which Christians were teaching that? Or That's what I'm saying. I, I can't think of one. I mean, you'd know more than me, but I can't think of prominent Catholic saints and philosophers. Who well, Cardinal were, Newman, for one. Well, I mean prior to Aquinas. Well, the Middle Ages were not an age of moral relativism, so that argument was not needed that yeah. much. So let me change my answer to the cosmological argument. Some version. <laughs> the design argument. Right, something like design that. Design and nature. I mean, we see something like that in Paul and obviously yes. from Aristotle. Yes. Point being, Aquinas denies both the ontological argument, which was maybe the most debated and certainly popular, and the Kalam cosmological argument, the Bonaventura yeah, or, or because, maybe he made some concessions towards it towards, towards the end of his life, but he seems to. My, my the quick point I want to make is just how intellectually honest Aquinas yes, is. Yes, that he refutes two very popular That's arguments right. for God's existence when he could have just said nothing on them and let yes. people believe them. But he thought to put forth bad arguments in defense of Christianity was to make. Yes, don't take too seriously those atheists on the internet. They don't know what they're talking about most of the time. Even Bertrand Russell made the absurd mistake of thinking that the uh, the cosmological argument contradicted itself because it began with the premise everything needs a cause and ends with the conclusion there's something that doesn't need a cause, God. Mm. But it never began with that That's premise. That's right, yeah. Of course, most Christians perhaps don't know what they're talking about either when they make arguments online, I'm not True. sure. Here's his said contra to, your, to mm -hmm. the ontological. He says, no one can mentally admit the opposite of what is self-evident, as the philosopher states concerning the first principles of demonstration. But the opposite of the proposition, God is, can be mentally admitted. We read, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Yes. Therefore, that God exists is not self-evident. So right. what is meant by self-evident and why can't we deny that, which is self-evident? A self-evident proposition is one whose predicate adds nothing to its subject. Uh, you ask, why is that not a self-evident proposition? Uh, it is in itself, logically and objectively and impersonally, a self-evident proposition because God is his own existence. But it is not to us self-evident because we do not know God's essence or nature. If we did know God's essence or nature, we would see that the argument is indeed valid. And in heaven we shall see that because we will see the very essence of God and see that his existence is identical with his essence. <laughs> but since we do not see or understand his essence in this life, it is not self-evident to us. Mm -hmm. Although Aquinas admits that the That's proposition right. is self-evident in itself. What's interesting is that Richard Dawkins, let's pick on him, thinks he knows what God is and rejects it. Aquinas knows he can't know what God is and believes. Yes. Here's his response. God has a sense of humor in allowing for Richard Dawkins. <laughs> I'm going to read this paragraph and you cut me off whenever you'd like to interject and, and offer some commentary. A thing can be self-evident in either of two ways. On the one hand, self-evident in itself, we've just touched on this, uh, though not to us. On the other, self-evident in itself and to us. A proposition is self-evident because the predicate is included in the essence of the subject. For example, man is an animal. For animal is contained in the essence of man. If, therefore, the essence of the predicate and subject be known to all, the proposition will be self-evident to all, as is clear with regard to the first principles of demonstration, the terms of which are common things that no one is ignorant of, such as being and non-being, whole and part, and such like. If, however, there are some to whom the essence of the predicate and subject is unknown, the proposition will be self-evident in itself, but not to those who do not know the meaning of the predicate and the subject of the proposition. Therefore, it happens, as Boethius says, that there are some mental concepts self-evident only to the learned, as the incorporeal substances are not in space. Therefore, mm -hmm. I say that this proposition, God exists, of itself is self-evident, for the predicate is the same as the subject, because God is his own existence, as will be hereafter shown. <laughs> Now, because we do not know the essence of God, the proposition is not self-evident to us. I love Aquinas so much. Yes. <laughs> uh, but needs to be demonstrated by things that are more known to us, though less known in their nature, namely by effects. It is self-evident that the Gosh. point could not possibly be said more clearly. <laughs> so no need to comment. No need to comment. Every, every word is exactly what it ought to be. I... I find a lot of things in Aquinas similar to Aristotle's definition of truth. The question, uh, what is truth, is the easiest question in philosophy to answer. 
Aristotle says, if one says of what is that it is, That's or of what is not that it is not, he speaks the truth. But if yes. someone says of what is that it is not, or of what is not that it is, he does not speak the truth. Right. You, you can't say it better than that. There's no need. Yeah. Um, the example that Aquinas gives is a very useful analogy. Uh, it, 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 it probably sparked the, uh, uh, the Protestant reformers' uh, famous joke about scholastic philosophers argue about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. Well, that's a joke that's a joke on itself because that's a very good question. Mm. Uh, and the answer is an infinite number. As many as God wishes. <laughs> because uh, spirits do not take up space and are not confined by space. So yeah. there's no limit to the number of angels that can be present in consciousness spiritually at any particular place. Yeah, that's good. I've said... And because I, m m no, most people don't understand spirit. They think of spirit as, as material beings. Yeah. Well, some and therefore, of, they think there's some answer to how many angels can dance in the That's right. Yeah. And other people do understand spirit well. So that's why Aquinas uses that uh, as an analogy to uh, the fact that none of us understand God's essence. Some of us understand the essence of an angel. All of us understand the essence of whole and part. Yeah. I've said jokingly that Augustine is beautiful like a garden is beautiful and Aquinas is beautiful like a game board instruction manual is beautiful. Hmm. I'm joking. I know that Aquinas is actually beautiful. But what I love about game board instruction manuals is there's no ambiguity. No yeah. word is wasted. Yes. You'd be angry if it was. Yes. If during the course of reading the instructions, the person began giving, your, giving you their opinion of the game or the, about the time they first played it, it would just sort of... You, that's not what you're there for. You're there for a very direct, mm -hmm. concrete answer. Yes. I want to read um, Aquinas, obviously, famously, has five remedies for sorrow. Um, pleasure, weeping, the sympathy of friends, contemplating the truth, and finally sleep and baths. I love <laughs> and, it. And a glass of wine. He I, mentions that too. He doesn't. He doesn't? No. That's a I've common that misunderstanding. Quoted. I know. It's not true, though. Ooh, a misquotation. Yeah, I know because I wrote a book on happiness and did a deep dive into this and was desperately looking for that quotation. Ah. Yes, yeah, so I've heard that too. A, um, a, a good night, a, a large glass of wine, but he doesn't He doesn't say it. Ah. Uh, if I'm, I'd love to be proven wrong though. But here's the said contra, uh, no, the respondio, and I'd love, well, both. And I'd, I'd love you to talk a little bit about self-care. I'm not sure if you're aware of this phrase, but people a lot today are talking about the importance of self-care, which... I think understood rightly is a good idea, mm -hmm. but uh, taken to an extreme might just be sort of solipsism or selfishness mm. or abandoning one's duties. But anyway, he says, Augustine says, I had heard that the bath had its name from balneum, from the Greek, I'm not even going to try, from the fact of its driving sadness from the mind. And further on, he says, I slept and woke up again and found my grief not a little assuaged mm -hmm. and quotes the words from the hymn of Ambrose in which it is said, sleep restores tired limbs to labor, refreshes the weary mind, and banishes sorrow. And so here's Aquinas' response. As stated above, sorrow, by reason of its specific nature, is repugnant to the vital movements of the body, and consequently whatever restores the bodily nature to its due state of vital movement is opposed to sorrow and assuages it. Moreover, such remedies, from the very fact that they bring nature back to its normal state, are causes of pleasure. For this is precisely in what pleasure consists, as is stated above. Therefore, since every pleasure assuages sorrow, sorrow is assuaged by such like bodily remedies. Well, that's almost self-evidently true. Yeah. If you accept the psychosomatic unity. That's right. If, on the other hand, you're a Gnostic who believe that you create your own identity and your body is simply malleable material, it makes no sense. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, are you familiar? Who's the that that philosopher we had? Um, golly, he, we had to walk him up the stairs that time because the elevators were out. He wrote the meaning of say Jay Budzhevsky. Yeah. Oh, great man! He's terrific, and He's I love great. what he said about the body. He says the body is equally a part of who you are, along with the soul. If it weren't, think of the absurdities that would result. When I kiss my daughter goodnight, it's merely me manipulating the husk which is not me and pressing it against the husk which is not her. Yes. I like yes. that. But if you understand yourself as body and soul, then taking care of the body is to take care of you. No, no chemist, when he kisses his <laughs> wife, says this is only chemicals kissing chemicals. I hope not. <laughs> yeah, very
very good. All right. We have one follow-up on lying, if that's okay, from mm-hmm. Gavin, who heard our response. Mm. He said, uh, for further clarification, well, he doesn't make an argument for it. He just simply states it. Deception does not equal lying. We also don't determine whether or not something is intrinsically evil by finding a situation where our intuitions are to do that act. Fair enough. Mm-hmm. And then he says, I'm just wondering, what is leading Kraft to go against Augustine, Aquinas, etc., who don't think you should lie even to save a life? And then he says, and to clarify, the lying definition I'm having in mind is to assert something you believe to be not true with the intention of to deceive. Deception is different that, oh, here we are, than lying because deception can work under double effect and lying cannot. Even in context, card games, acting, etc., are people saying things that are not true and trying to make you believe it, but are obviously not assertions and trying to deceive long term. Well, if you see war as a kind of serious game, you can use that principle to justify uh, hmm. deceiving the Nazis and protecting the Jews. So I still think it's a matter of, of what language you use uh, to... Uh, translate yeah. the principle that lying is indeed intrinsically by its nature wrong because uh, truth is a good uh, and people ought to be willed good things rather than bad things. But life is also a good and sometimes it's necessary to kill in order to save life, mm-hmm. such as in self-defense or in a just war. That was one of the uh, points that... Uh Janet Smith brought up. She said, it seems interesting to me that I'm allowed to kill the Nazi. I'm allowed to, say, go out and dismantle his car so it no longer works, but I can't say the Jews aren't in the basement. Yeah. 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 Lila Rose was involved in that controversy too. She was. uh, And I would, yeah. She would go into Planned Parenthood dressed up and pretend to be. Of course you should. Yeah. No, I disagree. I think she's wrong to do that. So all sting operations are wrong. You can't get drugged. I'd have to say that. You can't. Doesn't that suck? I'm biting a bullet like a loser. I know. I am very uncomfortable with that. I hope you are because I think your moral intuitions are are, are not working I think a man who saves three women from sex slavery by pretending to be someone other than he is sins while he does a great good. No, you can't sin and do a great good at the same time by the same act. That's not possible. The act, he, okay, is, the act then, is meritorious. Fair enough. Then he intends to do a great good, but doesn't. No. He does a great good. How about the outcome is a great good? I no, mean, it's, God, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not utilitarianism. It's not that the end justifies I'm not the trying means. to justify the act by saying the outcome's good. That would be utilitarianism. I'm saying the act is evil while the outcome is good. You are never permitted to do evil then you sh- that's why I'm saying you shouldn't be doing sting operations. But I don't think a sting operation is intrinsically evil. Yeah. And I'm very uncomfortable with that part of the position I'm holding. Well, I think the difference between us is I would have once agreed with you when I was a, <laughs> a more rationalistic philosopher who wanted to do everything deductively, starting with principles and then applying them unambiguously to difficult situations. Now I'm a little more intuitive, I think, and, and in sympathy with not utilitarianism, but William James's version of pragmatism. Sometimes sometimes good and evil are not simply an impersonal option that you are to choose or not to choose. Sometimes good and evil are not created by your action, but sometimes your action is so embedded in the situation that it it becomes part of the objective principle. Uh, that's, That's a bad way to put it. Example. Example from James. Uh, a new neighbor moves in next door and uh, he seems to be very snobbish and off-putting because he deliberately avoids you and when you look at him he looks the other way so you conclude that uh, well I'm I'm stuck with a snob and I'll just have to put up with it and if he doesn't like me I won't like him and I won't talk to him or alternatively you can say I shall create a new situation here Mm. I shall deliberately invade his life uh, and and welcome him to the neighborhood and see what he's made of. And you do that. And you find out that he's he's extraordinarily shy mm. and he's not arrogant at all. 
And he was in awe of you for some reason or other because <laughs> your, your lawn was so perfectly was, mowed. Yes. And you, you make good friends with them. Now, uh, are you not creating a new good or even a new kind of truth by, by your action? Yeah. You are. So sometimes you don't start with thought and end with action. Sometimes you start with action and end with thought. Mm. Now, whether that applies directly to the, uh, the cases we're, we're thinking about is, is questionable. Sure. But the fact that your act of, quote, lying, unquote, to the Nazis uh, intuitively feels right, and at the moment you do not think that you're sinning, uh, I think counts for something. It probably counts for lessened culpability. Mm, you want to, you like want to say more the than base that. The tenet of more moral relativism, though, to just say if something feels like it's not a sin, then it's not a sin. No, I certainly don't want to say that. Okay. Yeah. And our intuitions and our feelings are far from infallible. So this is an example of a, of a genuine moral dilemma that in this life probably will not be settled. Sure. Uh, if two honest and moral people are arguing, yeah. they will probably not come to agreement. I mean, most difficult questions, if one is to take a hard position, uh, lead to difficult questions. Like if I say God exists and he loves us, and then you point to all the insane amount of evil that's taking place while we've been sitting here, I feel uncomfortable about that mm -hmm. and may not know how to respond to that adequately. Mm -hmm. Uh, or if you're an atheist and I point to the uh, the seeming teleology in the universe and uh, the conditions uh, at the Big Bang, that's mm -hmm. you know that sort of thing, maybe that makes your life a little difficult as well. It's the person who doesn't hold any view uh, perhaps can keep changing his mind. But Aristotle sagely says in the Nicomachean Ethics that uh, ethics is uh, somewhere between art and math. Uh, uh, math is, is very clear and certain, and if it's not, it's bad math. And art is very free and creative of its own values. If not, it's not great art. Mm. But ethics is between the two. It has clear principles, uh, but there are inevitably going to be mysterious things that are not very clear, and uh, honest and good people can differ about them. Mm. Um, as we begin to wrap up, I don't want to because I'm so enjoying this, but we probably should. We're going to go down to the Cigar Lounge to have you sign some books. Thanks again for agreeing to do All that. Right. What advice would you give? And you've kind of mentioned already about, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that the church has been run by scoundrels from the beginning to some degree or another, and yet it's still standing and how that's some, something of an argument for the uh, legitimacy of the church. Uh, but there is a lot of very confusing and difficult things going on right now. What advice would you have for someone looking to convert to Catholicism, but they look in and they just see, A, a lot of confusion coming out of Rome, and B, infighting among Catholics all over the internet. What sort of uh, advice would you give Take them? Take your eyes off the whore and uh, look at the husband, God the Father. That's beautiful. Christ commanded you to, uh, uh, to marry this whore, to enter this, this very imperfect organization, which, though run by scoundrels, has preached a high and holy and heroic truth uh, for 2,000 years without ever contradicting itself, which is a miracle. Mm. It's good for me, too, to remember that it's, uh, you know, when I stand before our Lord, he's not going to ask me, did I call Pope Francis out on things? Mm. Or uh, did I have the correct opinion about the status of the SSPX or what the German bishop said? Mm -hmm. I mean, unless I'm in a place where I have to make a decision about these things mm -hmm. or speak authoritatively on them, which I don't. Perhaps I'm interested in those things because they pull me out of what is my responsibility, loving my wife and children and being mm. kind to those around me. But I have the catechism. I have the lives of the saints. I have the sacraments. There's no excuse. Get to it kind of thing. You know? mm -hmm. But we all feel like we need to be pontificating on what's going on. Yeah. Maybe it's because, Including we, myself, maybe I'm an idiot. It's because we want a substitute for a kind of idolatrous <sighs> revision of... The absolutely, absolute, absolute of, of the will of Christ, which we know is going to lead us into things we don't want to go into. Kinds of suffering and kinds of, of overcoming our self-consciousness and egotism mm. that we're afraid of. And it's so much more comfortable to say, I identify myself as a conservative or as a liberal or as, a, uh, as yeah. this kind of ideology. Yeah. 
this reluctance to see myself as the problem. I once had a confessor say to me, you're far better and far worse than you can possibly imagine. That's why I love Dostoevsky. He shows me those two things. There is a Fyodor Karamazov in me. There is an Alyosha Karamazov in me. That's right. There is a Hitler in ourselves. There is a Christ in ourselves. That's right. Terrifying. Yeah. Uh, any other, did we get any comments or anything as we there wrap up? There were a few up? super chats. Oh, uh, was there? Your wife and son are out the door if you want to. Run oh, they can come in. Oh, they might be locked. I think it's locked. Yeah. All right, we'll wrap up. Well, can we, can we wrap up? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. I hate it's, traveling, and I'm 39. Yeah, I, I can't imagine too. what it was like to be 85 yeah. and, and travel. Thank you so much for taking when the time. When I was your age, I sort of enjoyed traveling. Yeah. Now it's just it's awful. Lines everywhere. Yeah. It feels like uh, flying's gotten more and more difficult too, of course, over the years. But anyway. Um, I know you don't want compliments, but um, shut up. You're going to take it. Uh, I am grateful to you and on behalf of my audience uh, who've been very blessed by your writings and your example. Thank you for being uh, uh, so good and so helpful. And I will uh, throw those <laughs> ugly compliments right back in your face. <laughs> All right. Good. God bless you. Thank you, Peter.